Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington Select Board for Wednesday, October 13th, 2021. This is Select Board Chair Steve DeCourcy. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan? Yes, thank you. John Hurd? Yes. Len Diggins? Yes. Eric Helmuth? Yes. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapelain? Yes. Doug Heim? Yes. And Board Administrator Ashley Meyer is participating remotely. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act signed into law on June 16th, 2021, that extends certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency. The act includes an extension until April 1, 2022, of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's order, which is referenced with agenda materials on the town's website for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely, so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also simultaneously being broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment, and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. Finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. We have another number of important items on our agenda tonight. So let's see how much of the town's business we can get done. Um, I'll now move to the next agenda item, item two, COVID-19 update. Christine Bongiorno, Director of Health and Human Services. I will promote her right now, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Good evening, Ms. Bongiorno. Thank you for joining us. All right. Thank you. So I have for you tonight just a quick overview of where we're at today with the pandemic. And then with your permission, Chair DeCourcy, I'd love to share just a few um, pages of uh, information that sort of summarizes the past 20 months, if, that, if that's okay. I know that you're on a timeline, you have a short timeline, so I will keep it very brief if, if you give Certainly. it. Certainly. Take as much time as you need. Great, so um, if I could just have um, screen share ability, I will um, share my screen in just a moment, but I just wanted to give you a quick update as to where we're at today. Um, so as you know, the, um, the Board of Health enacted a, a, a mask order, which um, is in place for um, any resident, any person going into public spaces within town, um, open, you know, indoor spaces that are open to the public. Um, that mask order was put in place in August, the beginning of August, as a result of what we saw as a significant increase in cases all across the, the town, the state, um, and the, the country. Um, that was a result of the Delta variant, which was hitting both vaccinated and unvaccinated people. So we, um, the board, the Board of Health, decided that it was incredibly important to put an, an order in place. That order will expire when we in Middlesex County have two consecutive weeks of uh, low or moderate transmission. And so the CDC puts out a map that um, can be viewed by anybody at any time that, that categorizes counties. Massachusetts, um, Middlesex County, which is where we are in Arlington, has been um, significantly, we've been in the high um, category for quite a bit of time. Um, we're currently in, in the next step down, which is substantial. Um, which is a good, which is a good thing. So we're seeing a slight decrease in cases in our in our county. Um, I'll just give you a quick rundown of the numbers. So in June we had seven cases of COVID. July we had 41. 
in August, we had 151, September 139, and then so far in October 35. So if we sort of run the numbers for October, we're looking at, come, you know, we've come down a bit. So we're anticipating about 80 or 90 cases um, for the month of October. So it just, it show, it demonstrates a, a decrease in cases. So that's, that's promising. Um, at this time, our office still continues to obviously follow up on complaints about masks. Um, we're now planning with the schools to, um, hit the ground running once the vaccine becomes available for the children five to 11. So we're planning, um, doing some planning meetings now to be able to roll that out, to roll up clinics for um, children um, once it becomes available. And um, we continue to uh, look at, you know, boosters, the Pfizer boosters now available. So we're looking at possibly putting those, those um, clinics in place. Um, although right now we're really focusing our efforts on putting um, ch vaccines for children um, clinics out in place. So I just want to share my screen briefly. Um, so that's sort of where we're at currently. Um, and I just want to share my screen to just give you a, a quick overview of, of some of the information um, that we've been collecting over the course of the past 20 months. Um, so this looks like a lot. So we've been um, Health and Human Services, which is made up of a number of divisions. We've been really working um, around the clock, I want to say 24-7, um, since last March. So, you know, contact tracing is a big one. I think that's really a, a big piece of what the health department's been doing. We had over 2,200 positive cases. Over, well over 4,000 contacts that our department has been working on and, and working through. Um, and then as far as resident support, you know, our, our department, Council on Aging, as well as the Medical Reserve Corps volunteers, um, did about 7,000 food deliveries in partnership with the food pantry. So that, that was a major effort. Um, that started last March, March 2020. Um, our, our office, in addition to the police department, we de delivered 6,000 masks. So you may remember back in the early days when masks were, you know, why do we need to wear masks? I think that was a big question. Um, before that became official, our department was out delivering masks to senior housing, Menominee Manor residents, and just residents in general that were in need of masks. Um, so, so that was a really major effort that our department um, participated in. Um, and then we also, the Health and Human Services Charitable Corp, um, established a, a fund that people were able to donate to, and then we were able to distribute um, a significant portion of that funding to residents in the community. Um, wanted to just quickly let you know that AYCC pivoted quickly. So the Arlington Youth Counseling Center pivoted and began offering telehealth visits. So they offered over 10,000 telehealth visits um, over the course of the past 20 months, um, which, is, which is major because so many people were suffering, so many kids were suffering through the pandemic. And so to be able to pivot that fast and to be able to offer that much service was, was quite amazing. Um, the COA on the Council on Aging side for the seniors were able to pivot and provide um, resources for seniors to stay connected and to have volunteers calling. Um, so that was a, a great effort. Um, and then the health department continued to enforce orders, um, the governor's orders, as well as local orders to make sure people were safe um, and that they were able to follow um, the, the, the rules to, to make sure we prevented future COVID cases. And then on the vaccine front, you may remember um, our office participated in the early days um, vaccinating. We partnered with Belmont and Lexington and led the effort to vaccinate. We've done over 6,100 vaccinations. And as you may remember, I, of course, was, um, pretty vocal in my, my, um, my feelings on the lack of local rollout of the vaccine. Had we had the opportunity, we would have been well over, you know, we would have had many, many more vaccines distributed among our three communities. So, uh, but, but still so proud to say that our staff were, were able to, to jump in and, and get that many done. Then on the medical support side, um, in the early stages, you may remember a lot of um, cases and deaths in long-term care facilities and nursing homes around the state. So our, our team was really involved in the early days, working directly with long-term care facilities to identify cases, um, do contact tracing, try to prevent the next cases. Um, and, and it was really a scary time, if you may remember. Um, there wasn't a lot of PPE, so that was another thing our office did, led by our veterans agent, Jeff Chunglo. Um, he collected PPE from residents, and we were able to, to send that out to our long-term care facilities, as well as our hospitals in the area. Um, and we also, our Medical Reserve Corps volunteers were dispatched to go to long-term care facilities because the staffing was, uh, a lot of them were quarantined, a lot of them were um, sick themselves, and they were unable to work. So we were able to dispatch um, volunteers to go into these facilities that were nurses, physicians, and, and therapists. They went into these facilities, both hospitals and long-term care facilities, and, and did, did the duties that were needed. So that was a um, pretty, pretty significant um, role that our, our Health and Human Services Department played. Um, 
I just want to go to the, the next slide. So I just threw a bunch of pictures because I feel like, you know, so much of this was just, we were doing, 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 and we tried to stop and like take some pictures to remember. Um, but I just wanted to throw up some photos quickly. Um, as you can see from the top left, that was the first press conference after we had a, a positive case in a school child and we had to, um, you know, communicate to our community what we were doing and what, um, what, what was needed from them. Um, and that was a really scary time for our community, if you may remember. We ended up having to shut down um, one school in town. And um, we locally, as you can see, there's like a little map and then there's a, a picture of a Zoom meeting. And that Zoom meeting was our, um, our, our COVID meeting team for, that's like our, our department head team um, meeting, we met daily, um, especially in the early stages. And the reason for that is because a lot of the rules, a lot of the um, decisions that needed to be made about closing things like schools and um, businesses, a lot of that happened um, not at the state level, not at the federal level, but really at the local level. So, um, you know, an effort led by uh, town manager Chapdelaine and a lot of the city managers um, and, and mayors in the area um, to, to meet with experts such as um, Dr. Bittinger and Dr. Walensky to really learn, learn and understand what's what the science was behind COVID and then really being able to help us understand how to apply that to making rules and, and regulations in our community to try to prevent the spread and to try to stay ahead of it. So you may remember local cities and towns came together to close schools before the governor made the decision to close schools. So that was that was a really big step in, in um, really helping to curb the, 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 the transmission. Um, you know, some of the other pictures, there's Marcy uh, Shapiro-Eyed from the Council Asian giving out masks in the Monotony Manor. Um, the police, I mean, Marcy was at the, the senior housing and the police were at the Monotony Manor. Um, there's a photo of some of our volunteer nurses that were working at uh, South Shore Hospital. Um, our Arlington nurses that went down there, that was amazing. Um, there's the food delivery program that the Medical Reserve Corps and the, the Council on Aging participated in and delivering um, 7,000 uh, you know, bags of food to, to residents throughout the pandemic. Um, the Council on Aging shifted a lot of their programming to drive through to keep people engaged um, and to feel like to con continue to be part of our community. Um, and then again, it's more food delivery, a lot of food delivery um, at senior housing. Um, through the you know the food pantry and then the last uh, picture on the bottom is um, our testing we did a drive-through testing in uh, last december so that was um, something that we were able to offer with armstrong as well um, and then just quickly pivoting over to our vaccine clinics which was um, really just a coordination of so many um, of our community partners. So, you know, we had volunteers from our community as well as all of the departments in town from the facilities department, DPW, as you can see, we had fire and police driving seniors from the parking lot into the clinic. We had everyone participating. We had Food Link gave us flowers to give out to seniors, as you can see, and you have your own Ashley Marr from your department, from the select board's office, um, handing out those flowers. Um, we really, um, it was a really um, great opportunity for us as a, as an entire um, government to come together and to offer this service to our community. Again, as I mentioned before, had we had the opportunity to um, get as much vaccine as we were able to dispense, we would have been able to, to really um, to really vaccinate our community at the local level. Um, and we, we hope to do that for children and, and to continue to do boosters and, and whatever else is coming down the line because the, um, the mass vaccination clinics are now um, shut down. And so that really gives us the opportunity locally to, to be able to take, the, take that and run with it and be able to provide our community with the services they need. So, um, you know, we did these mass vaccinations clinics. We also did um, clinics in senior housing. We were also able to um, do homebound residents, so people that are unable to leave their homes, but still are an incredibly important population to serve because we did have a lot of people that um, received treatment in their home and were, were exposed to COVID through through their, their care providers. Um, so, you know, I guess we're at this point where we're really looking forward to the next phase where we're able to continue vaccinating and to really pivot to, to vaccinating our children in our community. So thank you for the opportunity to just give you a quick, I try to keep it as brief as possible, but just a quick uh, overview of, of where, we're, where we've been and um, kind of where we're, where we're going. So um, happy to, to share this presentation and post it online if people are interested. Okay, that's, that, that's great. Thank you, Ms. Bongiorno. And I'm gonna turn it over to the board, but I wanna thank you 
for all your efforts and, and your team in health and human services and in the health department, because it it was amazing. You go back to those early days that you, you showed and people weren't vaccinated. People were very concerned about what was happening. And there's a lot of information that was that was needed. And, and you provided that through the town. So, so grateful to you for that. Um, so I'll turn it to the board now for questions and comments. And I have a few comments at the end. Uh, Mr. Helmuth, I'll start with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bongiorno, and to your entire team, um, which, you know, I, it's, it's, I'm glad that you acknowledged all the other people in other, other departments of town. It was truly a team effort led, led by our town manager and you yourself and so many others. And it's really great to see those photos and to remember and to just take in how much it has been. I know that you're all really tired and that it is not over. And I hope you know how grateful your community is for always being there, putting up with people being frightened and frustrated and sometimes angry. And, and um, we often don't say thank you enough. So I wanna make sure that we do. I have one quick question just about the mask mandate criterion. You know, Middlesex County is, shall we say, an, on the, has, has an interesting boundary, you know, that covers towns all over, all over the place. So many of them aren't, aren't as urban as we are. Um, is the Board of Health thinking about any alternative criterion if necessary in the future that if, you know, the whole county looks okay um, or doesn't, you know, that if you feel, feel like the local nearer in data is different, would you do anything differently? Sure. So we, in addition to the county data, which is um, what sort of drives a lot of the decisions that are made, because the CDC recommends if if a community is high or substantial, the CDC is actually recommending that a mask mandate be put in place. So um, we were sort of following what CDC was recommending, but you know they're not making a rule is not a, a law that they're issuing. Um, we also look at our local data. We look at our school data. We look at our um, sewage data. So. Um, I've mentioned before the MWRA has um, a, a great um, presentation on their website that shows um, COVID in sewage. So basically, um, it's RNA that's measured in, in the sewage that's, that's pumped through the system. So we're looking at all of that in order to make the decisions. Um, obviously, we, um, we're trying to do the best we can, but I think that right now we're really relying on that CDC transmission map. Thank you, no other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So is it appropriate to move receipt of this report? Sure. Okay, so I'd like to move receipt of the report. Uh, and and, I'll, and also thank you for all, all of your, um, your, um, your efforts, um, Ms. Bonjour to you and um, the rest of your staff and the rest of the town staff. And I uh, have always supported me the conservative approach me to um, handling this pandemic. And, uh, uh, and and I think I think it's clear that that was the right thing to do. And and, and so I continue to support you uh, that way. Uh, and and I'm and I'm sure that you'll do a good job with the um, the vaccination of, of kids and, um, and and the boosters should you um, when that's appropriate as long as you get the supplies that you need. So I'm not going to extend this anymore. Just say thank you once again. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll second Mr. Diggins' move receipt. Um, and I do want to say to our health human services director, um, I'm really impressed by the fact, headed by you and from which it ebbs and flows all down to other department heads, your staff, their staff, that um, I was really proud that in the middle of, not in the middle, at the beginning, we're in the middle uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, instead of just doing what we needed to do to get by, um, you advocated for more work for your, your staff, um, instead of just sitting on your laurels and doing the bare minimum. Um, and that certainly is a testament to um, your department that you had along with the other department heads. And I'm very appreciative. And I just want to, I just have sort of an informational question, but I just want to remind people that, you know, Board of Health and Health and Human Services, um, is no question you can't ask them. If that's not the right department, they'll certainly direct you um, or join with you. 
to get the information or the services that you need. I myself was getting out information to all different people and I was fretting about um, one of my own family members' personal situation. And then all of a sudden I realized, wait a minute, I've been telling everybody else about all these great programs, <clears throat> at home services, excuse me, um, for the residents of Arlington. So um, it's not just for seniors, it's for disabled adults, young adults, um, if for some reason you're temporarily not able-bodied. Um, and so I wanted to ask um, Ms. Bongiorno, uh, you know, people are asking about people who have already received at-home services um, in their residence uh, about if that program is going to continue, will it apply to the regular flu shot? Will it apply to any booster shots? And are there any other services that people who find themselves homebound for medical or developmental issues um, that they should give you and your office a call? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Um, uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. I, I was hoping Ms. Bongiorno could answer that real quick. Oh, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, there was a pause there. I, yeah, I'm sorry, Ms. Bongiorno, if you, if you could answer Mrs. Mahan's question. I'm, I'm sorry <laughs> about course. that. Of course, so uh, yes, our, our department, um, we, we work hard to try to provide services to persons that are homebound, and, and absolutely. Um, as long as we have the vaccine and we have the staff, we will be out um, to help provide that to, to people in need, for sure. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you. I'm sorry about that the delay. There was a pause here, and I just went to Mr. Hurd. Now, Mr. Hurd. Thank you. Sorry, Mrs. Mahan. I, I didn't know if I was supposed to proceed, but <laughs> I go by the direction of the chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ronjono, for the presentation, and I, all my colleagues have said this many times, but for all the work that the Board of Health and the Health Department does and has been doing this entire pandemic to keep us safe, um, it's really extraordinary. So hopefully at some point we'll get one of these um, these updates in person in the chamber, but we certainly understand the situation now and better safe than sorry. Um, you had mentioned that the mask mandate is gonna expire when we're low to moderate and right now we're on significant. How many stages are there between low to moderate and significant that we have to go through to get there? Ms. Bunchero? Sure, um, there are four steps. There's high, substantial, moderate and low. So we need two consecutive weeks at moderate or low. Um, okay. So we have one more step to go down. Um, where we have modeled our regulation after the Belmont and most of the cities and towns around us um, yep. really adopted the same regulation. So we'll see everyone in the same in the same boat. So and did you see that, is that for the county wide or does Arlington individually assess that? No, it's it's by county. So um, yeah, it's the Middlesex County. So right now, um, if you were to look at the, the CDC transmission map, which is posted on our website, yep. um, you'll see that we're, this is red, orange, and I think it's maybe yellow and blue. Um, we're orange. So we're one step down from high and one step away from uh, the moderate. Okay. And are most of the counties surrounding us also in the same significant range? Yep. Yep, so most of the country's red. So most of the country's high. Um, right now, or in, you know, we're, we're one step down from red. Um, and I'd say there are a few other counties in Massachusetts, but for the ma majority of our counties where we are red in Massachusetts, but um, more orange in mass than the rest of the country, which is pretty good. So, and again, I think, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll sort of leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's certainly attributed to strong local efforts in the people in Arlington and our surrounding cities and towns. So, you know, just like you would say to everyone, stick with it. If you want to get there, you know, we, we all have to do it together. So appreciate the update and uh, look forward to talking soon on this. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, yeah, and, and I just want to, to, on a personal note, thank uh, Ms. Bongiorno and Health and Human Services. The September statistic showed uh, 139 positive cases. I was one of them. Um, I, I had a breakthrough case that occurred in September. The morning I got my result, I got a call from Lucille Nicholson of the Board of Health Nurse to ask me how he, how he was doing, um, answer any questions. She even followed up a week later on her vacation. 
um, to see how I was. So I mean, just a, a real testament to the to the complete uh, nature of, of of the follow up and the and, and the concern. And I, I I really appreciated it. And as I said, I was fully vaccinated. It was a breakthrough case. It turned out to be a mild case, but a but ten days of of, of the flu. And and I appreciated the guidance. Also, just a message, and, and I have a question or two. Um, we're at a stage here where each day we get further and further away from when we received our vaccine. So it's really all about minimizing risk. I, I don't know how I got it. I, I, I was masked, but it's, it, it's random. So I know people um, you know, can, can be concerned about the continued mask mandate, but believe me, it's the more you can minimize the risk, the better you are, off you are. And the one, and one thing I would say, based on, on my experience too, if you are feeling sick, get tested and stay away from people until you get a result because you just don't know. And, and again, while people are vaccinated and, and I'm sure I had a much lesser case because I was vaccinated, you wanna to try to avoid it and you wanna to try to avoid the, the risk of spread. So I wanna I want to thank you because I, I saw firsthand what happens when you get the call and the follow-up and I, and, I, and I really appreciate that. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask is we're now into to flu season. There are there is a need for people to get flu shots. And I'm wondering if that if there's any clinics that we can refer people to, they should go through their primary care physician and to pharmacies. And maybe if you could just comment as people get to the stage where they qualify for boosters, just the timing or whether it's okay to have a booster and a flu shot. You can actually get them on the same day. So that's that's the great thing about the flu and the COVID vaccine. Um, our, farm, our local pharmacies, all of them have the vaccines, both flu and COVID. Um, we will continue to work on getting, um, you know, getting the vaccines and be able to provide boosters as well. Um, we did run a senior clinic for flu uh, a couple of weeks ago, but we are now pivoting, like I said, to, to really focus on, on preparing for children, um, the five to 11 year olds, so. Great. Okay, best of light. And, and I remember earlier when we were running the local vaccination clinic and, and there was that frustration because the state was going to the mass site. So hopefully they do return things back to the local level uh, for children and, and, and for boosters. And, and so again, thank you, Ms. Bongiorno, for coming in. Thank you for your team and all the work that you've done. Um, so on a motion to receive from Mr. Diggins, Seconded by Mrs. Mahan, uh, Attorney Heim. Mr. Heard? Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Hellman. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Great. Thank you very much. Right. We will now move to the consent agenda. Item three, minutes of meetings, September 13th, 2021, September 20th, 2021. September 27th, 2021. Item four, request for a contractor drain layer license, Milltown Plumbing and Heating, Fred Webster. Item five, request for a special one day all alcohol license for October 16th at the Robbins Memorial Town Hall for a private event, Amy Mullen and Kevin Cole. Item six, for approval, Arlington Open Studios, Lawn Signs, November 1 through 13, 2021. Uh, Tom Formicola, ACA Executive Director. Um, on the consent agenda, um, I'll start with Mrs. Mahan. Approval. Thank no you. Questions. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Okay, Second. thank you, Mr. Hurd. Second. Mr. Diggins. No comments, no questions. Thank you. Mr. Hellman. No questions, thank you. Okay, on a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd, Attorney Hyde. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Hellman? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you, Attorney Hyde. Uh, next is item seven, appointments. Uh, Equal Opportunity Advisory Committee, Leslie Chang, term to expire June 30th, 2024. Mr. Chaplin, is, is Ms. Chang with us tonight? I thought I saw, yep, there we go. I will promote her right now.
Good evening, Ms. Chang. Good evening. Um, we received your written materials, but why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and why you're interested in the uh, Equal Opportunity Committee vacancy? Sure. Um, I'm Leslie Trying. I have been living in Arlington since about 2014. Uh, I, prior to this, uh, I'm, so I should say that I, I am attorney by trade. Um, and I'm sitting in my office right now. <laughs> so there's zero chance of my kids uh, fussing through the door. Um, I, uh, like I said, I've been living in Arlington for about seven years, really enjoy the community. And uh, I served as a nonprofit board member for about four years at a local art center. Um, so I, was, I wanted to do something with the town for a while, uh, just was not sure about what. And I saw the um, opening in the town email, uh, seeking commissioners and volunteers uh, to join. And I've been volunteering and attending the um, commission meetings since April of this year. I really enjoy the group uh, and I hope um, to bring fresh ideas to the board. Um, I have some experience with diversity and inclusion. I served on a, um, for Asian American professional organization for about eight years as a volunteer and then a board member. So I have some experience and hoping to um, promote diversity and inclusion in the town and town hiring processes and contracting processes. Great, thank you. I'll, I'll now turn it to the board. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Yep, I will move approval and just say thank you very much for your willingness to serve. The fact that you're still at work suggests that your time is <laughs> very valuable to you. So the fact that you are willing to step up and serve on this important committee really speaks volume of your character. So look forward to working. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Um, I will, you, you made a motion, right? Okay, and I'll, I'll second yes. it. Yeah, thanks, no problem, I'll second it. And, and, and I'm gonna gush a bit because this is my favorite part of meetings, you know, is getting to uh, read uh, resumes. Although I'm gonna end up with an inferiority complex to me, but perhaps as a psych minor, you can help me out with that. Uh, but you not only get town emails, you read them. So that's a big <laughs> plus. You know, and and uh, uh, I also love the fact to me, that uh, you you help out the um, other other uh, minority groups, I meaning Latin uh, Latinx I mean, and, and and Blacks, I mean, as I saw uh, on your resume. But if that wasn't enough, I mean, you study mutant zebrafish I mean, and <laughs> and. Um, um, Plasticity, uh, Alzheimer's and plasticity. You know, so a colleague of mine just gave a talk about uh, tau degraders. I mean, and Alzheimer's. So sooner or later, we're going to get a handle on this disease. You know, so I hope uh, so. And, yeah, and you know, thanks to all the early research, I me mean, on which we build, I me mean, that we will um, find find a solution. So thank you so much, me for um for being a part of the town and 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 serving on one of the committees. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the biggest reasons Arlington is such a great place to live is that people do exactly what you're doing, which is say, I want to help and I want to get involved. And it's just delightful to see your amazing background and your passion for equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I know that you will do great things in this role. And I just want you to know how much we appreciate you stepping up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, like my colleagues, Mr. Diggins, was also gushing and impressed by your initial um, background in microbiology, molecular biology. And I, too, <clears throat> as a court reporter, when I got all your materials, I was working on a case that involved neuroplasticity and Alzheimer's. So I took that as a sign. Um, I, I Just not to put you on the spot, and there's no wrong answer, you certainly have a varied ba background in terms of who you've represented, um, groups that you belong to. Um, I think there was Al Alpa and um, a few others. Um, how do you see your role either blending in with the current members and or um, what it is you'd like to bring um, to the committee that perhaps you don't have much of or could en enhance a little bit? So one of the, the issues with uh, what I, I've encountered, at least uh, through attending those meetings as a volunteer, is that we have positions that, are, that needed to be filled, but we are unable to find the qualified candidates. And we're hoping to promote 
uh, sort of a little more diverse uh, candidate pool. And what I can bring is my connection to various professional organizations in the greater Boston area. Um, I certainly have a lot of contacts in these areas and hoping that I, you know, we can cross post or promote some of the positions within Arlington. Um, and so that we can get a greater um, applicant pool that way. Thank you. And you certainly sound and have borne through your curriculum vitae, you're the woman to do it. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, yeah, and I, I also support uh, your appointment. Um, you have a really impressive resume and, and we see this from time to time. I was really impressed by the fact that you went to the committee meetings, got involved before you were appointed, um, saw that it's something you wanted to do, but that that is really impressive to, to do that ahead of time. And I know you'll add a lot to the committee. So thank, thank you for your willingness to serve. Thank you. Um, so on a motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins for approval, Attorney Heim. I may on a personal note just note that uh, one of the most important details has been left out, a University of Connecticut Law School graduate right here. So uh, also very exciting on that front. Um, Mr. Hurd. We are overrun by Suffolk Law people in this area, <laughs> so it's good to have that. That's right, um, go Huskies. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Deans. Yes. Mr. Helmut. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Great. Thank you, Ms. Train. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right. Item eight, appointment to the Veterans Council, terms to expire June 30, 2024. Les Banks and John Fitzpatrick. Mr. Chairman, I see Les Banks. I don't see John Fitzpatrick on the meeting. Okay. Um, if perhaps he's logged on under another name, if he could try to raise his hand, that might help as well. All right, well, he's doing that. Why don't we start with Mr. Banks and then if Mr. Fitzpatrick joins us, we can have a separate dialogue. Good evening, Mr. Banks. Good evening, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm just fine, thanks. Good, good. Yeah, so if you could, we have your written materials, but if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and uh, why you're interested in being on the Veterans Council. Okay, well, I'm a lifelong Arlingtonian, born and raised, same house, as a matter of fact. Arlington um, Public Schools, BU, and first 21 years of my life. and. Uh, off to the world for the next 40 and decided to come back here and retire, believe it or not. So I've been back here for about 20 years as well. So the first 20 and the last 20. Um, I had an occasion recently, or a couple of years ago now, to meet Jeff Chunglo and um, help him, he helped me through some issues. And in the process uh, became obvious to me why I hadn't, uh, volunteered before, being a um, nine-year active duty and a lifelong vet myself. So I threw my hat in the ring with him and understand they need a couple of people. Um, there are a few issues that he needs help with and I'd like to be the guy that helps him. He's a real asset to the town. As you know, we're the only state in the uh, US that has a dedicated VA guy and he actually gets called upon for uh, uh, purviews other than Arlington and shouldn't have to. So he needs some help and I'd like to be the guy to help him. Um, uh, like I said, eight, eight and a half years on active duty, Vietnam mostly, uh, US Air Force. And um, uh, that's about it. Great. Thank you, Mr. Banks. And before I turn it over to the members, th thank you for your service uh, in, in, in the Air Force. Um, and I will start with Mr. Diggins. Yes, yeah, so and I'll echo the chair on the appreciation for your service, and I will make a motion to accept um, your um, uh, your position. Uh, your, 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 I'm sorry, I'm blanking out on, on the phrase here, hey, but to accept your appointment hey, to, to the position on the Veterans Council. And I will say that in addition uh, to um, being in admiration of your service, I am 
really an aberration of your willingness to keep going and not retiring me because I, I I don't foresee myself retiring either. I mean, it's just it's just life is too too interesting, you know, to not take it, you know, as 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 much as you, you can. And and um I just have a hard time believing that you're 81, you know, so you, you're really quite the, quite the inspiration. So thank you for your service and, and keep doing whatever you're doing. And, and, and I, I, I will keep an eye and watch and learn. Thank you. I'm only 81. So I got a few years left. Oh, like another thank you, 20 Mr. Probably. Uh, Mr. Helmet. Thank you. I'll echo everything that my colleagues have said. And uh, I would say, Mr. Banks, uh, given your history of trying to retire, uh, you're going to fit right in. And uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and I'm glad that you mentioned uh, the asset that, that Jeff is to the town. He does does great work for our veterans. I do part of my day job. I, I work to, to, to support veterans and have really uh, grown to just increasingly every day admire the contributions they make for our country. And uh, so I'm delighted that you're stepping up to, uh, to help him out. Thank you. I hope you all got a chance to see the video he put together for Memorial Day. I did. Uh, I, was, I was one of the participants, but uh, a well thought out and uh, well presented through ACMI and uh, hasn't really gotten so much publicity as perhaps it should have, but uh, it brings up most of the issues that veterans will confront and it's capitalization of, of what we need to do, so. Thank you, I did see that, and uh, I appreciate you mentioning it. Thank you, that's great. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, also, very sincere thanks um, for your eight years of service in the 60s, um, and coming home after that, and dealing with the aftermath of your service um, to our country, and um, I truly do appreciate it. Um, my dad said, make sure you give the Air Force guy a, a good hello. <laughs> He's U.S. Army. Um, and then your 32 years as a commercial pilot, I'm sure you have uh, pre-COVID some pretty interesting stories, um, probably more lighthearted than perhaps the pilots of today are um, dealing with. And I agree with you on our Veterans Affairs Director, Jeff Chungo, He's beyond amazing, and his wife, Diane. Um, and I'm not his wife. <laughs> We've been at events and they say, I wanna thank Jeff and Diane, and the people come up to me and I'm like, no, it's, I'm not that one. But one of the issues that um, has sort of been um, dominating a big part of my heart, and I know also Jeff Chungo's, is um, not only um, getting employment opportunities and services for veterans and their families, but um, the shockingly high suicide rate among our veterans. And I know Jeff, um, that's something, the 22 club, um, and I'm sure, sure that's something in whatever way of your expertise or background that you, you'll perhaps be able to add for that. Similar to what you, you're doing tonight, um, bringing the attention of the Memorial Day um, ACMI video, encourage people to go to the ACMI um, website and download that. Um, I'd really like to, just done a fantastic job on it, but there's a lot of people that are, for valid reasons, uncomfortable um, about talking about it, but it, it's an important issue to be addressed. I don't know if you have any comment on that. It's okay if you don't. Thank you. On a personal note, I don't know if you remember, Diane, but your grandmother was my babysitter. <laughs> oh. Um, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, and thank you for your willingness to serve. And my colleagues have all mentioned this, but this cannot be said enough. Thank you for your years of service to the country. Um, I'm going to agree with Mr. Diggins. I do not believe that you're 81 years old, so we're going to have to ask for a birth certificate to prove that. But I'm going to disagree with him on retirement, though, because I can't wait to retire. But Thank you for, Arlington has had a great history of veteran services and it's continued immensely under our current director, Jeff Chunglo. Jeff does amazing work for our veterans in town. And we, even in the midst of COVID, we've still been, been able to honor our veterans. And I don't think a lot of cities and towns have been able to do that in quite the manner that we have. So this is a really 
incredibly important position that you're taking on. And I know you don't take it lightly, but I really do want to thank you for your willingness to step up and serve on this council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. And, and uh, yeah, I want to echo the, the comments of my colleagues, but I, I do want to say it is great to be appointing a fellow Terrier. Um, to, uh, I also went to, to, to Boston University, so it's a college night tonight, and uh, for yeah, now yeah. it's BU. Um, and, 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 and again, thank you uh, so much. And, and just a, another quick word on Mr. Chunglo, Mr. Chapterlin and I did, did participated in the Memorial Day um, presentation as well. And, and, and Jeff was amazing in terms of, he wore every hat, producer, director, did, you met us, did, waited as long as it took. And I'd like to say it was only one take for my presentation, but uh, he, he was very patient and, and uh, really put together a memorable and, and moving presentation um, for Memorial Day. So uh, thank you again for your willingness to serve and uh, look forward to, to, um, to, to seeing you around town. Thank you. Um, so on a motion to approve uh, by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Great. Thank you, Mr. Banks. Thank you all. Now, Mr. Chapter, uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick may not be with us. I don't, his name is not on the attendee list. There is a phone number, um, a 781 phone number. I, I think I would just say if the 781 number ending in 170 is Mr. Fitzpatrick and he dials star nine, it, that should raise his hand. Um, if that's not him, um, then clearly he's not here. Okay. All right, doesn't look, no, like, doesn't look like it. Okay, all right. right. So. I'll, we did receive his written materials and, and his, his, his resume. So I will turn to the board, uh, starting with Mr. Helmuth. I'll move approval. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, second that, and perhaps we could extend the invitation for him to come in another night. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hurd. No comments, happy to support his appointment. Mr. Diggins. Yes, same here. Happy to approve, man. If he does come in, I'll be able to um, wish him uh, uh, appreciate express our appreciation in person. Great, thank you, Mr. Diggins. And yeah, and I also support the appointment. Um, so, motion by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mrs. Mahan for Mr. Fitzpatrick's appointment. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Corsi. Yes. So unanimous vote. Thank you. Uh, next is open forum. Um, except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or a request. Before we open it up for a show of hands, I just want the public to know we have three items after open forum we will be taking public comment on each of the three items. So if you, for purposes of open forum, if you were talk, wish to talk about something other than items nine, 10 or 11, now is the time to do so. All right, Mr. Chairman, there's one hand up. Oh, there's one, one hand raised um, right now, Kristen Anderson. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good evening, Ms. Anderson. Thank you. Um, Kristen Anderson, 12 Upland Road West. Um, I am a town meeting member representing Precinct 13. And um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, during six rainstorms between July 2nd and September 2nd of this year, Somerville and Cambridge discharged 24 million gallons of sewage contaminated water into the Alewife Brook. 
It is time again to put pressure on the cities of Somerville and Cambridge in order to encourage them to start developing a new long-term control plan to separate their sewers and reduce pollution in the Elwife Brook. To the best of our knowledge, the existing long-term control plans were completed in 2015 and there are no new plans to further separate the sewers that discharge untreated sewage contaminated water into the Elwife Brook. As a leader in combating climate change, Arlington must prepare for its effects. We must become resilient to a wetter rain season, more severe storms, and rising sea levels. We must consider the environmental health of our neighborhoods and how the sewage discharges affect community health in East Arlington. Save the Elwife Brook is hosting a community walk on Saturday morning to raise awareness about active combined sewer overflows, also known as CSOs, which discharge into the Elwife Brook. We will be meeting at 10 a.m. on Saturday at Arlington's Bicentennial Park on the Elwife Greenway on the corner of Mass Ave and Route 16. We will go on a spooky treasure hunt for the active CSOs, which discharge untreated sewage into the Elwife Brook during rainstorms. This will be a two-part walking tour uh, we're going to cover approximately two miles and we'll do the entire length of the brook. Um, but we welcome everyone to join us for any length of the walk and we ask the select board uh, to join us um, for any part of that walk on Saturday morning. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Anderson. There's one additional hand raised, John Warden. Okay. Let me try that again. Okay, there it goes. I think he's getting closer. Yeah, there we go. Good evening, Mr. Warden. If you can see us, you need to unmute your mic microphone. Hey, I still came up, but nothing happens. Yeah, okay. There yeah. It is. Yeah. Okay, I, 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 I'm sorry. I, well, my hand was raised prematurely. Uh, I, I wish to speak on the matter on the on the precinct matter, but I, I, I will. Uh, so I, I hope you recognize me. Then I will say I hope during that discussion you will give uh, Mr. Seltzer full time to to make his presentation on on that that very important matter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Are there any other hands, Mr. Chapdelaine? There are not right now. Let me, uh, let okay. me just, sorry, no, there are, there is not. Okay, all right. Well, that closes open forum. Um, I'll now move to the next item on the agenda. Item nine, discussion and vote, Mass Ave Appleton design modification, John B. Heard Select Board. Before we start this, um, this matter had come up previously before the board and I had uh, recused myself that evening. My sister-in-law is a business owner between Burton Street and Appleton Place and, and under the uh, conflict of interest statute, she's my wife Mary's sister. And as such, she falls under the definition of an immediate family member. The threshold for a conflict is much lower with a immediate family member. And based on that, I felt it was appropriate to recuse myself last month. I am also gonna recuse myself this evening and I'm gonna turn this part of the meeting over to our vice chair, Mrs. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just before we get started, um, originally I had planned for asking for a six minute break after this agenda item. Um, I should have anticipated that the chair would uh, 
be moving us along on the agenda. Um, so I'm not going to do that um, since I was thinking it would be in the nine o'clock hour. We're only in the eight. <clears throat> Excuse me. What I'd like to do for this, unless um, anyone else thinks differently, is first turn it over to our colleague, Mr. Hurd. And then after that, um, if you think it's appropriate, Mr. Hurd, to ask the town manager, Adam Chapdelaine, and or our uh, Director of Public Works, Mike Rademacher, for any presentation. Um, and if any of you three gentlemen um, think it would be more expeditious if I call from anybody else to provide information, and then I'll go to people who are raising their hands. So, Mr. Hurd. I think you might have just jinxed us, Mrs. Mahan, on the uh, quickness of the meeting. Thank you. Um, I will be brief and I can turn to Ms. Chapdelaine or Mr. Rodmarker for any details regarding the plan, but just a little background as to where we came to this updated plan after the last meeting where we were given two competing plans that I, I had noticed and looked at aspect of both plans that I liked. So this plan essentially came into being by me folding over one plan taping it on top of the other plan and coming up with a plan that was plan one on the right side and plan two on the left side. So this is, and I wanna thank the town manager and Mr. Radebacher and Green International Affiliates for jumping on this, getting a new plan drafted in the time frame that we needed to in order to get before the construction period that we need to put the paint down on Mass Ave. So what we have is, like I said, on the right side, if you're looking at the plan, Mr. Ma Mr. Chaplain, do, can you put the plan on the screen? Just as we can. Jason, are you able to put the plan up while Mr. Hurd speaks to it for a minute? I believe so. Let me uh, try that out real quick. And I think many people have it in front of them, but essentially the, I took the anything right of the crosswalk to the right side of Appleton Place from this view and took the aspects of plan one and then everything left of that crosswalk, took the aspects of plan two. So this incorporates kind of the critical safety measures that were advocated as you go on the, on the west side of Appleton Place that will help create visibility for cyclists coming down for, for motorists on Mass Ave who are taking the left. It has all of the safety issues, the safety improvements that were in both plans right at the intersection. And then it feeds into a lane um, as you go eastbound down Mass Ave and eventually becomes the shared road. So I, mean, I, I know this, we're presenting a plan that there's some people don't think is enough. We've also got some opposition to this plan. So um, we, to me, this is a, is a good compromise based on the competing interests and really taking all the necessary safety improvements and putting them into the plan to make sure that we have the safest option that, that we can present. I know there's plenty of different views on this particular plan what's necessary to I honestly can look in the camera and say that I believe this is the safest plan that we can come up with and as I mentioned before we all know that ultimately we're going to need to revisit this intersection sooner rather than later to put a signal in and at that point there'll be a new plan that will make this all the markings here obsolete as we put new markings down to coordinate with the signal and i think at that point one of the things that wasn't mentioned at the last meeting is one good aspect of this very dangerous location in arlington is there are wide sidewalks so i think as we go into a, a greater construction phase we can certainly incorporate some of the safety improvements that were in plan two that were originally per, per presented to us, such as the two foot buffer between the car and the bike lane. And I think that's something that we can 
that we can achieve when we do that second satellites. But that's how we got here. This is again, you know, what I see is a good compromise. I see this as the safest version of this plan that we can come up with. And I'm asking my colleagues to support or to essentially amend our previous vote to adopt this plan in lieu of the plan one that we adopted a month ago. Okay, Thank Mr. Hurd, can I take that as a motion to approve? I will allow, I'll leave it for my colleagues. Okay. Submit a motion. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, Mr. Chapterling, town manager. Thank you, Chair Mahan. So we have tonight with us Jason Govin from Green International, the traffic engineer that's done the work on this plan, as well as Mike Rademacher, public works director, and Dan Amstead, senior transportation planner. Uh, just to restate very briefly what Mr. Hurd has stated, um, the genesis of this was just a few weeks ago after the last board meeting uh, with Mr. Hurd requesting that we take a look at developing a hybrid option, as you all see on the screen right now. Uh, Mr. Rademacher quickly jumped on that and began working with Jason to draft such a plan. Uh, Dan Amstutz uh, quickly thereafter jumped on board to begin submitting comments uh, and suggestions of how to tweak and perfect the plan. Uh, just a week and a half ago, I believe it was last Monday, the design review committee met to review and comment upon this plan uh, and give it a public airing. And we really are moving on a pretty fast track on this to bring it before the board tonight so that we know what to paint uh, as soon as possible. Um, Mike Rademacher's worked hard with his crew at DPW to line up the requisite painting contractor. Um, would have been ready to paint option one, which was approved at the last board meeting. Um, if uh, this is approved tonight, we'll be ready to paint this option. If this does not succeed tonight, we'll still be ready to paint option one. Um, Mike can speak with a little more detail about that, but I think we're confident that we'll be able to get it done in uh, a pretty timely fashion one way or the other after tonight's meeting. But with that, I, I think it might be a benefit to ask um, Jason from Green to walk through this briefly um, and then uh, back to you, Madam Chair, for uh, board and public comment. Thank you, Mr. Chaplain. I uh, definitely want to call on Mr. Garvin next and um, when we start going through questions from the board, um, I'd be interested in our DPW director, Mr. Rademacher, comments on any future projects with, as Mr. Hurd cited, um, the wide sidewalks um, in this area, um, how that plays into, if at all, um, any future chapter 90 or otherwise projects. But um, Jason Govin. Yes. Um... Thank you all and um, thank you, Mr. Hurd, for um, looking into this hybrid option and kind of bringing this to fruition. Um, I think you did a, a good job in explaining kind of uh, what's in front of us here, but um, essentially, if, you, if um, you folks recall during last month's meeting, as Mr. Hurd said, we prepared two options and presented two options. Um, option one, which was shared lanes in both directions was ultimately approved. Um, option two was the bike lanes in both directions, which the bike lanes in both directions um, pe picked up where the existing bike lanes end, which is just east of Richardson Ave up to the top of my screen here where my cursor is. And those bike lanes both extended all the way through this project area that you see here on your screen, um, up all the way up to Forest Street and uh, Burton Street here. Um, the, dip, the main difference here, so everything from Appleton Place going west or to the left of my screen here in this area is the same as that previous option too. What we have changed is the area, which seems to be the critical area um, for the, um, especially for the businesses um, between Appleton Place and Forest and Burton. Um, the previous option too had the bike lanes in both directions in this area. And as a result, all of the on-street parking spaces on the south side were being restricted and there would be no on-street parking provided on the south side. What this hybrid option allows us to do is carry the eastbound bike lanes all the way through this area up to Forest and Burton where it will then terminate and pick up the existing shared lanes that continue east. So we have the bike lane in the eastbound direction. What that allows us to do is provide six on-street parking spaces 
basically just to where they begin just to the east of these two residential driveways here. And they go all the way up to where we restrict them to improve visibility at the existing crossing at Forest and Burton. So that gets us six on street parking spaces added on that were not being provided under the previous option too. We also are providing a varying buffer between this bike lane and the on street parking spaces. It varies from two to three feet as the pavement width in this section does vary slightly um, depending on where you are. So we are providing that buffer to add some protection to the door zone in the, um, for the bike lane in the eastbound direction. Um, however, to fit this bike lane in, we do not have space to fit a bike lane in in both directions in order to um, provide parking on the south side here. So what we have is shared lanes in the westbound direction, similar to option two, I mean, similar to option one, uh, where the on-street parking on the north side is consistent with what is provided under option one. Um, so essentially what you see here, um, the main difference is that we have um, the eastbound bike lane and the shared lanes in the westbound side. And um, pre uh, um, in relation to the previous option two, we are adding six spaces that were not provided under that option on the sell side to uh, facilitate the businesses, several businesses here in this stretch, as well as the residents on the south side as well. Um, and, and that is basically um, you know, a, a big overall summary of um, the changes from this hybrid option you see here uh, relative to the previous option too. Thank you, sir. Um, and uh, before I turn to my remaining colleagues, um, Mr. Rademacher, um, do you have any comments, brief or not, on are you literally ready to hit the ground painting tomorrow, next week? Um, and if you have any brief remarks about possible future projects in the length of the wide sidewalks up there. Sure. Uh, as far as painting goes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, we are working diligently to have our painting contractor uh, ready to go on this. It, we, it won't be tomorrow. It will be hopefully in the next week or so. We're battling um, temperatures. This will likely be done at night and temperatures need to be 45 degrees or warmer in order for the paint to dry. So we're trying to find a good window to get this done. Uh, but we have been in constant communication with them, letting them know that we're going to, this is of utmost importance that we get this done this season. So um, I, I'm hopeful or, or confident we'll get it done within the next week or so. And as far as uh, additional projects, we ha have already begun discussions on um, getting a, 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 a long-term, more comprehensive design started so that we can move into a a more permanent solution through this intersection, understanding that there are some proposed developments in the area, which um, may actually help us uh, pursue certain grant opportunities to help fund uh, a signal inter signalized intersection here. So we're looking for every opportunity we can to um, move this uh, forward as fast as possible. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, so um, I um, through you, I, I, I have a uh, um, couple of questions being um, one um, for um, Mr. Rademacher and one for um, my colleague, Mr. Hurd. Um, so Mr. Rademacher, so um, we're not saying that we put down um, this hybrid and then we can't do option two before we come up with the long-term plan, are we? Uh, um, no, we can do, you know, it's just paint. We can. Okay grind it up, we can paint over it, it's right. just lane markings. Great, great, thank you. I mean, uh, I guess one more question, I mean, about, about what's the cost? Uh, I don't recall off the top of my head, but I would say that's probably gonna be about 20 to $30,000 to paint. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, and so uh, to my colleague, Mr. Hurd, through you, uh, Madam Chair, and, um, so uh, you, you say that this is the most we can do, and, and why is it that this is the most we can do? So if I said that's the most we can do, I don't know. I must have misspoke. I don't well, know. maybe I don't, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I may not be quoting you correctly, but but I get the impression that you say this is this is the we can't do anything other than this. The other uh, this is the maximum we can do. Nope. Uh, that we can we can 
do whatever is presented to us. To me, what I had said is between the three options that have been presented to us, I feel that this is the safest, but that, and I know there's varying degrees and there's varying opinions on this, but to of the three options that were presented to us, one, two, and now one and a half or moderate alternative one, this is the, what I've seen fail to be the safest okay. approach and it addresses all the critical safety concerns and it's a good comment. It's a good compromise of the competing interests that you have at this intersection. Gotcha, understand. So, so here's my statement uh, on this. And that is, it, see, I, I think that going west is okay. Um, I mean, I think the, the bike lane makes it safer uh, and, and I'm very appreciative of the efforts that has been put into me creating this bike lane. Me, but the problem me, that remains and that has been a problem all along, although it wasn't me, noted me, uh, uh, because me, the, the, the incidents me, um, with the, uh, the death of Mr. Proctor and the injury, major injury by um, um, I'm, by Leonard, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting your last name, Mr. Um, uh, Leonard, um, uh, is, is that shared lane on, on the, the east side. Mean, and so the Sharrow, mean, and, and we, mean, the research has determined that the Sharrows mean, are not safe. I mean, I know we got mean, this one letter mean, that indicated that by you know, putting a bike lane in there, that somehow you would increase the speeds of everyone and that would make things mean, less safe. Mean, but but I mean, that's not where most of the evidence is going on this at all. And, and, and I really feel that we need to do something, you know, to make the, 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 the westbound um, bike cyclists make that safer for them. I mean, a lot safer. It, it, look, if we had been able to get blue bikes I mean, to give us a setup in the heights, we would have had it. It, uh, and and the only reason we didn't is because they require that we have be less than three thousand, three thousand, no more than three thousand feet between stations. It, and so we would need a couple more stations to get us from Arlington Center be, to the Heights. Be, and so already we're we're wanting to have people be, use cycles, uh, bicycles, me up to the Heights. Be, I have participated in the local rapid recovery plan, I mean, and even though that is focused on the bike lanes, I mean, um, and, and it's worked with Lexington and Belmont, I mean, still they want to get a more um, uh, the bike racks I mean, in the Heights, I mean, and, and um, Eels, which is now everywhere, Arlington, Liberal Streets, we want to see a more um, bike racks in the Heights. And that's all to get more people going to the Heights, which would be good for for businesses, I mean, it's, it's good for, for active transportation, which is good for health, I mean, it's good for the environment, I mean, and we just need to make that area safer, I mean, a lot safer for everyone, and, and we're just not doing it, I mean, uh, and, and I, I just want to push as hard as I can I mean, to get those bike lanes there, because I, I just don't want something to happen there, and for us as a board, you know, to regret not doing the most that we can do. And, and the most we can do now I mean, is to put that bike lane in there you know, to, to protect people. Uh, and so it, it, I wish that I had saved my one person uh, to talk to on this board for you, Mr. Hurd. I mean, uh, Mr. Helmuth came to me earlier on saying, well, you, you know transportation, can you just um, talk with me about this? But and I, I really would like to have just been able to go back and forth with you on this in order to be, help us both be, understand be, um, this intersection and this, 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 this section better. Uh, and, and so I guess one more question uh, to you through the chair is like, is there anything I can say that can get you to support that bike lane going west now. Um, and if I could, Mr. Diggins, before Mr. Hurd answers, just procedurally, we have what is before us tonight. Um, so that's all we can vote on tonight. So your efforts to um, 
direct this to Mr. Hurd um, isn't germane to what's before us tonight. Okay. What was before us at the last meeting, that's when the conversation and trying to convince your colleagues, you know, I, I've been on the board and sometimes I didn't even get a 2-2 two -two vote. It was a 1-4 vote. And, you know, you have to move on and, and do what everyone's suggesting yourself, Mr. Hurd, that this is one step and we've discussed uh, Mr. Hurd and Mr. Rademacher, um, future steps that when funding comes in because of development up there and after the light goes in, that we're still gonna know this, nobody said this is the most we can do, but this is what is before us tonight. So trying to convince Mr. Hurd to change his vote from the last meeting um, is not legal. We can only vote on what's before us tonight. And I don't know if you wanna add, to, I, I just feel uncomfortable um, I mean, to me, this is a good hybrid solution, one of many to occur in the future. But I don't know if you want to add to that, Mr. Hurd, and then I really want to move on unless you have a motion, Mr. Hurd. No, well, well I'm, I'm willing to make a motion. I, I'll withdraw the question to Mr. Hurd. And, uh, and so I'll ask you procedurally, Ms. Ch uh, Madam Chair, we, uh, well, I, I'll tell you, never mind, never mind. Here's, I'll make the motion. And, uh, I will make the motion that, that we accept this plan a, but I would like to add to it that we revisit a, this this intersection a, um, by February at the very latest. Is that acceptable? Well, first, I, I procedurally I need a motion. But I did. I just made a presented motion. Presented to. I'm sorry. Let me get my words out. See the punctuation. I, I need a motion to approve so that um, Mr. Rademacher and other department heads can put the bids out, get the painters lined up. Um, and if, if you want to have it in there, um, that I think it's already been stated that we're going to, we're continuing to revisit this. I don't know if February of next year, if that's, um, I mean, we could have, yes, we can revisit it in February of 2022. Okay, so that's the motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, Mr. Mr. Hearn, did I cut you off? No, you had essentially said what I was going to say was sorry that we had a we voted to approve option one so this is just trying to it's this plan versus our option one and I think that's been that has been clarified so and I'm happy to revisit the we'll put the paint down and we can spend time continuing this conversation because we can change it anytime um but if it's February Mr. Dickens can certainly work with Mr. DeCourcy, if he's able to, to have an agenda item in February to do so. Okay, um, and with that caveat, if anything happens before February 2022, this board will certainly consider it. Um, Mr. Hellman. Thank you, I will second the motion if it hasn't been already. Um, Thank you. And, um, you know, I, I'm looking forward to hearing what the public has to say, I think that, um, my inclination is just very much to support this, and this is why. Um, you know, I also, with Mr. Diggins, uh, preferred option two when we, we discussed that, and I think the board wasn't ready for that, and that, that's how the process works. Uh, I really believe this option is a lot better. I think the bicycle advocates that I've talked with believe that as well. I look at the conflict zone where the bright green paint is on our screen, and I see a bike lane going into that. And the bike experts have, that I've spoken with, the safety experts uh, tend to agree that that will slow bikes down because it'll narrow the travel lane, it'll give them confidence, it'll get their attention. The solid green paint in the conflict zone uh, is more visible to motorists. And you know, as we said, and we all agreed the last time we discussed this, none of these paint solutions will, will, will make a drastic difference in the conditions that have caused this, the fatal and serious crashes but they can make a substantial difference and they're far better than doing nothing. And you know, I believe that this compromise is far better than the one we had. Um, and I wanna express my appreciation to Mr. Hurd um, because I think that compromise is not a dirty word. Incremental change is not wrong. Um, and, and I appreciate the, the effort that he put into this and certainly that our town staff and contractor put into this to, to move very quickly to be responsive um, to that to improve this. So I want to be on the record for that. And, um, you know, the last thing I'll say is, 
uh, you know, I think that we are probably putting off the uh, what is probably inevitable. You know, I think that, as I said last time, and our, co our contractor uh, agreed that it, we get mass stop funding to redo this intersection, that it's very likely that they will require um, dedicated bike lanes in both directions. And that is consistent with the Connect Arlington plan that we all endorsed the vision of sustainable transportation that, that increases more equitable infrastructure for bicycles. Um, but, you know, I think my sense is that if, if this is as far as we can get now, I am happy about that because it is substantially safer than it was. Um, so um, that's where I'm leaning now. And, you know, I look forward to hearing any public comment. Um, thank you, Mr. Helmut. Um, and I certainly um, agree and thank our colleague, Mr. Hurd, for um, coming up with a third plan that keeps us moving forward. Um, and I, I want to assure everyone, bicyclist, pedestrian, um, that those two categories are at the forefront of when we make, by and large, make decisions for the town. I do know that for many, many years, residents in East Arlington, we've had, at that time, we had, I believe it was three fatalities and probably uh, six to 10 serious injuries, uh, people crossing in the crosswalk on Mass App and CVS. And I remember, and I still from time to time have a conversation with the town manager on that because we still have it on our radar. I remember Bill Dotson, who was in his mid to 70s, um, would come to East Arlington Good Neighbor Committee meetings saying how as an elderly person who could ambulate, but you know was slowing down a little, he predicted I'm gonna get hit and killed someday in that sidewalk. And I think he was just 80 um, and he got hit and killed by somebody in that sidewalk. Um, so he became the third or fourth death. Um, so and I certainly haven't let that go, but you know, I think he passed six or seven years ago. So I agree we have to put pedestrian bicycle safety um, as we look at everything we do. Um, and I know the town has been doing that. So if I could, Ask um, Mr. Garvin, I, I don't want to be a pain or a dictator, but if you could for now temporarily stop screen sharing in case um, residents want to speak, but if you could have it on standby uh, in case we do need it in the future. Um, now's the time from the members of the public, if you would like to speak to the plan that is before us tonight as proposed by Mr. Hurd and um, developed by Mr. Rodemacher, Mr. Garvin, and Mr. Amstetz, uh, there is a three minute limit. Um, Mr. Chapelain, I see two. You wanna tell me who's first, please? Uh, first name is Petru Sofio. Okay, you could promote him. And if you can just give your name and address for the record, please, thank you. Hi, thank you um, all for this opportunity. I also want to thank Selectman Heard for bringing this back to the board. Uh, so after the last meeting vote, I was personally a oh, little I'm, disappointed. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just name and address for the record. It's just oh yes, of course. Um, All right. Petru Sofio, eight Elmer Street, Arlington. Um, so after the last um, committee vote, I was a little disappointed. Um, as somebody who traverses that corridor every day on my bicycle. It was disappointing to see that shared lane markings were chosen, but actually you've come around. And now that I see that 1.5 plan, I'm actually pretty excited. And I think that this is a good midterm plan before we get to study the parking. And I'm also very happy that this is going to be installed this year um, to improve my commute over the winter and in the spring. Um, another exciting thing about this um, project that hasn't really been brought up is that this would be Arlington's first protected bike lane. There is a small section after um, Appleton Place that includes a protected bike lane. So I really wanted to say that that's straight from Connect Arlington. We have not had any protected bike lanes in Arlington before. So that's something that really needs to be celebrated. And that's a big achievement for the town. So I think that this is a great alternative. It's going to help. You know, I talk to the crossing guards um, at the intersection because I know them and I go by there all the time and, you know, they really want this change. They're really excited, you know, because it's it's scary. I mean, I've watched that dismissal and 
there are people driving through them or like through the intersection on the red light and you know almost hitting them and they have to stand in front of cars to, so they don't hit the students it's really terrifying so having these traffic calming measures the flex post for the bike lane the curb extension and you know the pedestrian improvements i really think this is going to save lives and i think that if we approve this for now and then we can bring you know two or maybe even a better protected bike lane option to the board in the spring we can get that going and then we can get the mass dot for reconstruction you know this is this is the process straight out of connect arlington and i'm really exciting i'm really excited that this is um, occurring so i wanted to thank the board again and i hope you approve this option tonight thank you thank you thank you thank you for your remarks um Mr. Chapterling. The next speaker is Mustafa Vrabu. And it's just your name and address for the record. Thank you. Hello, uh, it's Mustafa Vrabu, uh, Shawnee Road, Arlington. Um, I agree with Petru um, that, uh, the, the, or, um, that this is a much better option than option one. And I am thankful that the town, and in particular, I guess, Mr. Hurd, pushed for this uh, option. So I do encourage you to vote for it if this is the only choice. Um, I guess I don't really understand the rules of the meeting where option, the original option two couldn't be raised as a uh, motion to be re-voted on or reconsidered. But um, I guess this is where we are and it's where we are. I'd like to point out one thing. On the westbound lane, you have an 11 foot wide space with a six foot wide car. So you have five feet left, that puts you within two and a half feet of either doors or cars passing you. For those of you that, and that assumes that that car is right on the yellow line, which it won't be. So that car will now be moved over maybe a foot or two. So you have about two to three feet for a bike to squeeze through there. And as somebody who bikes, and I don't know if you're familiar with the term, pressure pass, that's when a car comes by right on your shoulder. Um, it's a very uncomfortable feeling, especially when you have parked cars with doors on your right side. So this plan is an improvement. It's not as good as the original plan two. Um, it's a vast improvement because the eastbound lane is by far the more dangerous one, but you've now funneled people into a very narrow space um, on bikes as they head westbound and they'll be going slower because it's uphill. So cars will wanna pass and they'll be you know, frustrated. Um, and we have this plan and I'd certainly would vote for, ask your vote for this plan over option one. And I would ask, this is not the safest plan. The original plan two was the safest plan. Um, and again, it's an improvement, it's progress. Uh, let's hope it works. Um, let's hope there are no people getting smushed going westbound now. Um, and I would reiterate some things that I've written before. You're preserving parking spaces across businesses, not in front of them. The other parking spaces in both plans in front of the businesses were always preserved. They're always there. They were never lost. Um, so you're preserving parking spaces across the road from businesses um, in, in order, and, and you're squishing people with this plan. So if this is what we have, please vote for it. Um, it's an improvement. There still are dangers that you're putting out there that are going to be forced conflicts. But thank you for um, coming forward with this and moving this, you know, another step forward. Thank you. And just briefly, um... Any of my colleagues could make a motion to reconsider, but it would have to be on the same night as the vote was taken. If we all of a sudden um, took a vote on something that was not on our agenda, um, people pro and con could cry foul and could legally file a complaint against us because we have to give people notice of what we're voting and not just slip other things in. So I just want to let you know, and if I said anything wrong, Attorney Heim, I was incorrect. Please correct me. Doug Heim, Town Council. I think that the chair is fully within her discretion to determine what's within the scope of the contemplated motion. Thank you. Um, next, uh, Mr. Chaplin. Brian Restucia. Thank you. And if you could just say your name and address for the record. When you're promoted. Uh, hi there. It's uh, Brian Restucia, number 73 Rancliffe Street in Arlington. Um, I know last time this was before the committee, I spoke at length and I had some uh, strong words. Uh, so I'll be very brief tonight and to the point. Um, we know the plan before you tonight is not perfect. 
um, but I hope it's one you can approve and get moving on um, and that we can continue to refine and improve this intersection in the long term. Uh, thank you. Ooh, you are kidding, sorry. You didn't even get 20 seconds there. Um, Mr. Chaplin. Uh, the next speaker is Phil Goff. Thank you. And if you could just state your name and address for the record, please. Hello there, uh, Phil Goff, 94 Grafton Street in Arlington. I am also a member of the Design Review Committee. And uh, I wanna make this short and sweet, but I don't think I'll hit the 20 second mark. Um, but I do wanna uh, express my appreciation to Mr. Hurd, um, other town officials and to Green International for finding a compromise that I think does work reasonably well from a bike safety experience. Uh, putting the westbound cyclists in that really challenging position of a narrow 11 foot lane, it's a bitter pill to swallow for sure. But I recognize, you know, bicyclists going in that direction, they're going somewhat slightly uphill at that point, going slower, don't have the same dangers. And this ideally is going to be a condition for them or for, for people riding bikes in the westbound direction, just for hopefully just a handful of years. So I do hope the board does move forward with this plan. Uh, for immediate implementation, certainly before the weather turns. Um, I thought that last week um, we did have a very productive meeting uh, at the design review committee. And I do see uh, in looking at the revised plan that uh, Jason presented that uh, a few of the comments and suggestions made by the committee actually made it into the um, revised plan presented tonight versus the one last week, which I think is, is terrific and makes it uh, just a little bit better, that little kind of piece of protected bike lane that um, uh, Petra had mentioned is part of it and some other features. So uh, I thank you. Um, this clearly isn't the ideal that I wanted and others in option two, but I do look forward to working with the town perhaps next spring uh, when we look at the uh, results of the parking study, uh, re possibly re revisiting that option two, bike lanes in both directions, and of course, working with the town in the next uh, handful of years to uh, plan and develop a, a design that works uh, in the long term. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think there's one more, Mr. Chaplain. Yes, Scott Mullen. Thank you. And if you can just say your name and address for the record, please. Sorry, you think I'd be better at Zoom uh, by now. Scott Mullen, 68 Henderson Street. Can everybody hear me? Okay, I saw a laugh. Um, thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak tonight. When I spoke at the last meeting, um, my comments were this doesn't go nearly far enough, but it's the best uh, that we can get at this time, it seems. Um, and it looks like we're, we're still there. So I hope that this plan advances, but I just wanna give a little bit of context. Um, I live in East Arlington, but I'm up the Heights all the time. I used to work there. Um, they have a Penzies, so I'm up there all the time. Uh, Mariuchi, the new Japanese market, is amazing. Um, I was up there a few Saturdays ago uh, on my bicycle, which I rode on Mass Ave and on the path shared. Uh, and when I got up there, I realized, well, there's no place to park it. And I actually did a canvas from Forest Street all the way to Trader Joe's on both sides of Mass Ave. There's three bicycle racks, three bike racks installed by the town. Uh, it was an incredibly frustrating experience, as you can imagine. Uh, one of them is, is in the plaza in front of the, uh, the dry cleaners uh, right next to uh, Charlie Proctor's ghost bike. And I sat there for a few minutes and I just thought about that. And I wonder if there's a chance as part of this plan or even separate that we add a bike corral on that wide plaza. Uh, and that can give us an extra 10 or 12 bicycle parking spaces that might mitigate the two or three that are lost on that side of the street close to the businesses because if you can't park you can't park um, and what we seem to be doing is talking about parking for cars but we're missing the fact that uh, people do other things as well so uh, I did go up there last Saturday in my car because I had to get a bunch of big stuff and I had no problem parking near the Petco parking near the Wanamaker um, so just for context there so please approve this plan uh, move it forward um, and uh, thank you for your comments tonight. Um, thank you. Um, and I, I know our town manager and our DPW director are here and taking all this information. And I do know that I believe Jenny Ray um, 
with some business owners in the Heights <clears throat> on down close to this area and some Arlington residents. I believe they did a walkthrough uh, sometime this week, yesterday, today. Um, do you know anything about that, Mr. Chatelain? Just very briefly, I don't want to extend the agenda too much because of me. I believe there was a walkthrough. It might've been a little bit further than just this past week. Um, and I know there is a capital request in place for bike rack installation and expansion. Um, I would actually, if you don't mind, Madam Chair, pitch to Dan. Dan, do you know any specificity about plans for racks and the heights? Um, sure, thank you very much. Um, yes, I've talked about this actually with Ali Carter, the economic development coordinator. And so um, realizing that there is sort of a dearth of secure bicycle parking in the Heights in this area and, and sort of in general within the business area. So we're gonna be actually talking about that tomorrow. Um, there is some funding, some capital funding, excuse me, that was um, uh, funded and is available this year that uh, putting towards are going to put towards parks and some schools and there may be some additional funding that could go towards the um, uh, business areas as well but I think there's uh, additional capital funding that um, it comes in, comes into place uh, next fiscal year so definitely there's some funding available in order to do this what uh, Mr. Mullen was speaking about. Okay thank you. Um, so on a motion by Mr. Diggins seconded by Mr. Helmet to uh, move approval of this current Mass Ave Appleton design modification and that the select board will revisit this at the latest by February 2022, unless we um, get any information before that. Um, it's going to be a roll call vote and I assume uh, Attorney Heim will register uh, Mr. DeCourcy's vote for him. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmet. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Please uh, let the record reflect that it is a 4 0 vote with Mr. DeCourcy recusing himself from this discussion and vote. Thank you. Okay. How about a three minute break to allow Mr. DeCourcy to come back on and uh, then we can go into the very next agenda item. So. You're up in three minutes, Mr. Chairman. Time is back in the meeting. So uh, we will move on to the next item on the agenda. Item 10, discussion and vote, re-precincting requirements and proposed reduction in number of precincts. Um, before I introduce a speaker here, I, I do want to just summarize um, this issue, as as you know, has come is coming before the board as a result of the census that takes place every 10 years. Um, and as a result of that census and changes in population, uh, there is a requirement to take a look at precinct boundaries. Um, on July 19th, we received a presentation from a town clerk Brazil um, regarding a proposal to reduce the number of precincts from 21 to 16. We had a further discussion on the issue with public comment on September 13th. I believe there was a public forum the next week and in September, we announced that we would come back, take a vote initially on the number of precincts. After that vote was taken at a subsequent meeting, we would take a vote on the actual precinct boundaries. Uh, we pointed out that there were a number of things going on in the legislature in terms of the timing of legislative districts being drawn and a statute concerning the redistricting process that was going through the legislature. Um, the legislative maps have now been drawn. They were drawn yesterday, uh, released yesterday. Um, and last week, the governor signed chapter 56 of the acts of 2021, which concerns the re-precincting process. And uh, we'll get into that later too, but it does uh, basically state that we will follow the state's mapping process and we will have 30 days after the legislature selects their um, maps to submit maps to the state. Um, the process itself has to be completed by December 15th. We're on an earlier track um, for that, but I, I, I did wanna point that out. And there's just a lot of moving pieces here over the summer. 
it was important to all of us to hear from the public. We reached out to town meeting members. We heard from a number of town meeting members and citizens. A lot of that is summarized and, and contained in, in our agenda items. So what I was going to do, Ms. Brazil is with us tonight, if we can promote her. She had a brief presentation. I was then going to open it up to public comment. If any of the board members wanted to talk after Ms. Brazil spoke, happy to do that. But I was thinking we'd hear from everybody and then have the board speak. So at any time, if someone wants to speak, why don't you show a hand and, and I'll, I'll recognize you. Otherwise we will go through all of the commentary and then, and then have our discussion and potential vote. Um, so with that, and, and one other thing, Ms. Brazil did, I see her here tonight. Good evening, Ms. Brazil. Um, she did send us a summary of the comments that were received um, through the forum and through the Google poll that was conducted over the summer. I believe Mr. Chapline has that, maybe can put a link to that in the chat. It is part of the materials that were sent to us. Okay, great. great. Okay, um, and with, with to... that, Ms. Brazil. Um, sure, I wanna just um, touch briefly on a number of things. Um, and then um, the uh, two other members of the Reprecincting Working Group are with us. So um, it might be helpful for them to be able to uh, join uh, join our join us so we can you know they can we can get their perspectives and and uh, they can answer some questions. So um, yeah, I just want to sort of summarize um, a little bit about um, you know sort of where we are and um, about the proposal that the reprecincting working group made. Um, the responsibility really lies with the select board in this process to ensure that our precinct map meets the standards for population numbers and protects minority voting rights. The Secretary of State also provides guidance that communities of interest may guide our decisions about the boundary lines to address local concerns. Several of um, Arlington's most recent town meetings have focused heavily on zoning changes and the Reese Precincting Working Group therefore proposes that housing and income are important data that we should consider when reviewing precinct boundaries. The data is vital to help us determine whether the boundaries uh, divide residents who should have sh who have shared interests in a way that reduces the chance that they could elect town meeting representatives who share those interests. Um, the fact that as town clerk, I proposed reducing the number of precincts and introduced an additional element to the discussion doesn't change the primary goal of considering how the boundary lines impact issues of representation. The focus at this time should be on the residents, and that means all the residents. Um, the impact on town meeting and the finance committee has to be a secondary consideration. Um, regarding the feedback, I'd like viewers to understand that the community feedback submitted throughout the process covered a wide range of perspectives. If someone asserted, um, no one cares how many precincts vote in a school gym, someone else told us my polling place was very crowded when they added that third precinct. Um, so, you know, this was especially true um, around the details of town meeting. People who opposed the proposed 16 precinct map uh, aren't really arguing that it treats racial minorities or neighborhoods with similar income and housing badly and unfairly. They're arguing that changing town meeting itself is hard, but change is part of growth. So yes, with the 16 precinct map, we would have 240 town meeting members instead of 252. The presentation outline uh, we posted uh, demonstrates the vast majority of decisions are made by around 200 members in the course of uh, voting. So the focus should not be on whether there are 12 fewer town meeting members, but rather how those elected members actually represent local interests. People can assert that 240 is worse than 252. Ultimately, that's an opinion. It's not universally shared and it's not the most important matter at hand. With larger precincts, each resident would have the opportunity to elect three more representatives from their precinct. The goal here is to get the map right, resulting in town meeting members being more representative of the racial housing and economic profiles of their precinct. Um, that's why we talk about increasing representation under a 16 precinct model. Uh, the 16 precincts will be larger geographically compared to our present map. 
So some town meeting members may not be able to canvass their precinct on foot as easily. If keeping 21 precincts maintained a situation where everyone could regularly walk their precinct, um, there would be more of a trade-off to consider, but that's not really the case. Uh, people have calculated how many residents each town meeting member serves and how many people live in a precinct. Our numbers are very low in comparison to other communities now, and they would still be lower than the average if we reduced to 16 precincts. This is not, um, this is not a radical change in terms of the numbers and the statistics. Um, what is a radical change is this opportunity to re-envision our map to acknowledge how things have changed in the last 50 years. 50 years ago, the select board chose to establish 21 small precincts, and I assume it solved a problem specific to its time. The advocate article announcing the change to 21 precincts from 14 didn't provide a reason, and no record of the debate was recorded in the minutes from that fall. And there didn't appear to be public participation in the decision either. So it wasn't a transparent process in 1971. So we can take heart, despite our community's differing opinions now, that we are including residents in the critical discussion, and that we are, for the first time in decades, considering residents by using demographic data in our deliberations. So I wanna talk briefly about equity and uh, what it means to consider equity in this process. Equity does not mean treating everyone exactly the same because that can perpetu perpetuate existing unfairness. The goal is to take proactive steps to improve access to voting and representation. Voting and representation can be emotionally charged subjects because they are so vital to our rights as citizens. The feedback from residents was very evenly split in the end. There was no universal truth here that a majority can agree on. And when you're talking about voting and representation, it's important not to assume that a majority that agrees on something is even a good thing. The working group started with two key ideas. We committed to following the data rather than relying on the precedent set by lines that we're just familiar with. Given the magnitude of changes in the early state drafts and the possibility of changing all the lines if we changed the number of precincts, we felt that if it was likely that most precincts would be affected, it was preferable to level the playing field by having all precincts elect their town meeting members at once. We feel this would be an open process that would be easy for incumbents and new candidates to place their name on the ballot. Additionally, if we assume that there is an expense to running for town meeting, it is not fair to place that expense on some precincts only. Distributing the burden of running across all the precincts in this case is the most equitable option. The benefits to reducing election overhead are multi-layered. It's less about cost savings outright and more about efficiency. If we can spend the same dollars and get more services, that's a win for the taxpayers and the voters. That savings comes from reallocating the election workers that we hire now to run 21 precincts on election day. So they would be available to assist processing mailed ballots in the weeks before an election. The Senate has already approved their version of legislation that calls for the state to mail out vote by mail application postcards to all voters for state primaries and elections. That tends to increase voter participation in mailing ballots, which is great for voters and democracy, but it adds a significant burden for my staff. Towns will also soon be likely, we, we hope, able to offer in-person early voting hours for local elections and also have the option to mail our own postcard applications for local elections. Again, these are great services for voters, but they add expenses that we need to consider. 16 precincts frees up some funding and time that is desperately needed if we are expanding the way we run elections. My staff hours and overtime hours can't be, <clears throat> can't be the default solution, especially for a high turnout election. Moving forward, there will be more costs to running elections, and I'd like to manage that better and fewer precincts can help. The public participation during this precincting process has been as open and transparent as we could make it. The working group added the least change map boundaries to our interactive map tool so residents could see the data that we're working with. 
keeping town goals and commitments in mind, uh, and I quote here, we value equity, diversity, and inclusion, and are committed to building a community where everyone is heard, respected, and protected. Our conclusion is that a minimal change is the wrong approach because it ignores the values that we are standing for. And after studying the least change map, we can see precincts where the outcome is worse based on our equity lens. Similarly, we have found that many of the concerns raised about changing town meeting don't engage with the central equity issue. There are larger and smaller representative town meetings with many more or many fewer residents per member. Our town meeting ratio of residents to members is very average in comparison to towns that have a ratio ranging from 246 or to uh, down as low as 88 residents per member. If we change to 16 precincts, that would change our statistic, uh, that ratio statistic from 183 to 193, which is a very small change um, in exchange for increased representation. If we want to explore a radical new town meeting that is vastly larger, we can do that, but it's a separate process. Reprecincting is the focus now, and it's about drawing equitable boundaries. It's about resident voting rights. It's about working to make space for residents to run for town meeting from precincts that are more coherent demographically. So ultimately, equity and efficiency both point to 16 precincts. The 16 precinct map has fewer lines dividing residents in ways that can undermine their voice at town meeting. It considers diversity from multiple standpoints, race and ethnicity, housing type and economics. And it better accommodates and accounts for future precinct population increases in areas where development has been approved or will need to be considered to comply with the state's housing choice and MBTA communities legislation. The map allows better options for adjusting polling locations that improve access by having more residents vote along Mass Ave. The Reprecincting Working Group recommends the 16 precinct model to you. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Brazil, and, and thank you to the members of the Reprecincting Working Group who are with us tonight, uh, Ms. Linema and Ms. Harvey. Um, so we, unless there are any questions right now, I was going to go through public comment and then come back to the board. Um, and I see the list of hands. So we'll go down the list, uh, starting with, uh, I believe it's John Warden who's first. Yes, Okay, it's just a video. Yes. Oh, don't touch. Yeah. Maybe no, we can hear you, Mr. Warden. Oh, good. Good evening. Good evening, good evening Mrs. Mr. Warden. Yes. Uh, oh, uh, well, now I can't see any of you, but um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just speak uh, very briefly, and I refer back to that meeting uh, that you referenced where this was uh, this uh, uh, plan was first uh, advanced to the select board. And I was uh, I was in the audience, and I spoke to the I spoke to the, uh, that issue that, on that occasion as well. And uh, I believe it was Mr. Hurd who, in the course of discussion, said that such a dramatic change uh, uh, from uh, uh, custom of the past fifty years uh, should only be done after a, a robust, uh, community-wide discussion of, of, of the issues. Uh, that uh, discussion has not occurred. I mean, a lot. Some people have weighed in. The local newspaper, uh, which I think very few people read, has hardly mentioned the thing. Um, that that uh, forum that was had was basically a farce. Uh, the, and the uh, some people have weighed in, uh, sent in letters, whatever. Uh, uh, but the the only way to to really get the sort of uh, community wide, and I think this this is important because. Uh, people have been going to the same base, except during COVID, the same voting places for years, and all of a sudden they'll go to a place and say, "Oh no, you can't vote here anymore. You're you're in some other precinct now." Well, that's not really a very good way to encourage voting. Um, so I would um, 
I, I say that, that, that you should at this point adopt the simplest, least change plan. Uh, and then if you really want to get into reducing the number of precincts, which is a pretty fundamental change in, in the structure of our, our town, town meeting, finance committee, and so on, then you ought to have that community-wide discussion. And that can only be done in the post-pandemic era, era when we can have real meetings in real places with real people and have real proper good discussions of the issue. So I, I, I urge you to stick with the 21 precincts for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, next is John Leone. Starting my video. Hey, good evening, Mr. Leone. Good evening, Mr. DeCourcy, and members of the town board, town select board, Mr. Chapterlane. Um, John Leone, town meeting member, precinct eight, also a town moderator. I've been a precinct town meeting member since 1994. I do recall the last time we re precincted, it was 10 years ago. And at that point, we made minor changes as possible to the precinct lines. I think we only moved three precinct lines and that was done between the town clerk, myself as town, um, town moderator and Ms. Grapelka with the board, uh, select boards, executive secretary at that time. And I believe there was one other person, but we didn't go to the extent of eliminating five precincts. There are a few, few um, comments I wanna make first. Let's toss out the fallacy that there's going to be any savings here. Um, there's no real cost significance. As far as the cost of mail-in voting um, being decreased, that's not so. I mean, we're going to, we still have 32,000 voters in the town. They all vote by mail, whether it's mail with 16 precincts or 21 precincts, it's still going to be the same exact cost. It's not going to be any decreased. Um, Mr. Mark Rosenthal of Walnut Street did a calculation that appeared in last week's advocate. I'm gonna give the gentleman credit. If we took out five precincts, we'll save $6,445 per election. Let's face it, on our $177 million budget, that's payments. He came out to 0.0038% of our budget. So I don't even think cost should be discussed in a change of this magnitude. It's not even a rounding error. Um, currently 21 precincts, 252 town meeting members, 12 per precinct. The new proposal by the town clerk and the committee, 16 precincts, 240 town meeting members, 15 per precinct. We're cutting out 12 town meeting members. Um, I care about that. We're disenfranchising 12 people and the people that they represent. Now, you might not think 12 is a lot, but we have 252 town meeting members. They all, they don't all come every night. We all know that. But if we have less town meeting members, it's going to affect our people who show up. It's going to affect the um, quorum. It's going to affect the loss of a number of other things. First, finance committee. One member per precinct, we're cutting out five members. They're already overworked. We're gonna to have to rejigger the finance committee and how that works. Um, I'm not sure how we, how we would do that. We have five at large members. Um, we're gonna to have to change all the bylaws and town manager act to make all this stuff work. Also, a lot of the committees of town meeting forms gives the moderator the duty to appoint four, six, some other number of town meeting members. If we're cutting out 12 town meeting members, that lessens the pool of potential applicants for those positions. Um, so it's gonna lessen the number of potential people that the moderator can appoint to those committees. We have some 60 odd committees. And if we start taking out potential members from those committees, it's gonna affect the pool of applicants in, Town meeting is where people usually cut their teeth politically. 
if they want to run for this board, they want to run for the school committee, housing authority, they usually get on town meeting. And if we have- Excuse me, Mr. Leone, you're, you're at about 3.40, so if you could- uh, Okay, I'm almost done with the course. Okay. If we cut out 16, down to 16 precincts from the 21, we're lessening that pool, we're lessening people who can vote in town meeting, and we're also increasing the burden on those other 240 town meeting members in that they have a larger pool of constituents to deal with. So I think that the board should really consider staying with the 21 meeting, 21 precincts and just going with whatever plan has the least amount of change to precincts in order to keep some continuity with the process that we've had for the last 50 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leone. Uh, next is Don Seltzer. M Mr. Seltzer contacted us before the meeting. He may have something that he would like to share. So Mr. Chaplain, I don't know if we can allow him to screen share when he comes on. Good evening, Mr. Seltzer. Good evening. Uh, thank you, I'm Don Seltzer, Irving Street. This seems to be a night for third options. So what I would like to present to the board and to the public, a third alternative precinct map. Early on in this process, it was thought that rebalancing would be a major deal requiring significant changes to all of our precincts. But then the official census data was released in August and it became apparent that there were solutions involving fewer precincts and mostly minor changes. It is relevant to your decision tonight about the number of precincts because it provides a clear contrast between the 16 precinct option with major changes and a 21 precinct map with minor changes. And um, as we discussed earlier today, Mr. Chairman, I have a short video presentation and request permission to share my screen. Okay, I, and I think, can we do that, Mr. Chapdelin, on the? Mr. Seltzer should have that permission right now. Okay, and, and bearing in mind that there is a um, video presentation here and sometimes you have some technical issues with you all, I'll give you a little leeway on the timing. Thank you very much. Let's see if this works. First time I've tried it. Every 10 years, we are required to adjust our precinct lines to make sure that they are reasonably equal in size. The 2020 census shows that of our 21 precincts, we now have two that are oversized and three that are undersized. In East Arlington, only precinct five is a little undersized. That can easily be fixed by shifting over the small block at the Warren Street and Broadway Triangle. As an added bonus, these residents will now be able to vote at Thompson School just a few blocks away rather than travel to Town Hall. In Arlington Heights, only Precinct 16 is undersized. A small sliver can be shifted from Precinct 18 to correct this. The affected residents will continue to vote at Dallin as before. In Arlington Center, Precinct 8 is undersized and Precinct 17, just across Mass Ave, is very oversized. By expanding Precinct 8 to include the area between Mill Street and Grove, Mass Ave and the bike path, both precincts can be brought into balance. All of the affected residents are within an easy walk to Town Hall far more convenient than their current poll location at Pierce School. Precinct 15 is very oversized and no single neighboring precinct can absorb the entire excess. The first shift is to transfer the northern corner of Precinct 15 over to Precinct 13. These residents will continue to vote at Stratton as before. On the east side, 
a large block of 213 residents can be transferred to Precinct 11. This is a neighborhood that is in the Bishop School District and the residents will have a shorter walk to their new poll location. The final adjustment is transferring a small strip along Summer Street from Precinct 11 to Precinct 15. These residents will have a slightly longer drive to Stratton to vote, about 500 further than their former location at Bishop. With these few changes, Arlington will meet the requirements of fair, equal representation. The added bonus is that more than 500 residents will have a new voting location that is much closer to their home. These changes also meet the state guideline of not diluting the voting strength of racial minorities. Only a tiny fraction of Arlington residents are affected. 98% will remain in their current precinct. Mr. Chairman, I'd also like to just quickly address one point that you made earlier about the state legislature finally def defining the um, boundaries for the Middlesex 23rd and 24th. With these Too two quickly, boundaries, Mr. Seltzer. there is no possible 16 precinct district that can be made to fit within these district um, borders if that is a concern to this board. It is very easy to do with a 21 precinct model. Thank you very much for your indulgence. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. Uh, next is uh, Joanne Preston. Good evening, Ms. Preston. Um, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Joanne Preston, Mr. Um, Lake Drive, town meeting member, Precinct 9 for the moment. Um, I, I guess I'd like, just like to move forward in my remarks to say um, I really question whether this Precinct 16 model furthers equity. I was quite actually, after I looked at all the statistics, which are very complicated and frankly, not correct, some of them, um, I, I'm just shocked that you would argue that. So let me go forward with what I want to say. Um, I want to talk about how the option 16 precinct adversely affects our minority residents. In Arlington, our non-white population is not evenly distributed throughout the town. I think people know that. It's concentrated in certain neighborhoods. As predominantly white neighborhoods are added to the precincts where minorities are clustered, the minority residents' voices are diluted. And I would like to give an example. For instance, the Arlington Housing Authority Family Complex, um, 49, in a survey last year, 49% of the residents self-identified as non-white. So we have a cluster of minority residents. Um, as more and more predominantly white neighborhoods are added to the existing precinct, precinct one, as required by the 16 precinct plan, the ability of our non-white residents to make their issues known is greatly diminished. I hope everyone is following that. Um, that does not further equity um, because as you add more and more predominantly white neighborhoods to a cluster of minority residents, their voices are diluted. It, and their influence certainly is. Um, for that reason, um, 
I urge you to reject the 16 precinct plan and adopt what we just heard, a, the least disruptive plan so that these neighborhoods can still stay within their precinct and have the same amount of influence. Um, I'd like to add one more thing because I think I have another minute. Um, I, I want to- About 20 seconds. Oh. But uh, Webcow neighborhood that I live in has been joined on the other side of Medford Street with two very big neighborhoods, which I and most people here don't know anybody there. So we now, it looks gerrymandered actually. Their suggested change is that we have this precinct that goes from Mystic Valley Parkway to Mass Ave. And we would have to walk and with the map, right near Mass Ave is the polling place. People in my neighborhood would have to walk um, over a mile to get to the polling place. You, Ms. Pressing, so you're at 3.30, so if you could wrap, wrap up, please. Oh, I thought I was out of time. <laughs> no, but well, no, you, you are, you, you, think... well, you're over time. So if that, oh. that's it, that, that's okay. fine. Thank you for your comments. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, next is it, um, Charles Foskett. Hi, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't know how to, Good evening, Mr. Foskett. How to get my camera oh, here. Work. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the select board. Uh, I, I've had the uh, pleasure and the opportunity to speak with you before, but I would just like to reinforce uh, several of the speakers that I heard this evening um, and, and note that um, this proposed 16 precinct plan is a disenfranchisement. In disenfranchisement of voters. There's no cost savings. It will have uh, an impact on the finance committee of which I'm a member. And by the way, I've been a member of town meeting since 1976, so that's 45 years. And I um, strongly object to the uh, proposed 16 precinct change. One of the reasons that I object is that there is no mandate from the public, from the voters or from town meeting to make such a drastic change in our representative town government. And um, what we basically have here is a proposal that's made by a, a, a very small group of people, most of whom are not elected uh, members of the uh, community. And in fact, uh, when the uh, town clerk ran uh, for office last time, I don't recall that this subject of going from 21 precincts to 16 precincts was ever mentioned. And finally, and most importantly, I'd like to note that the current system is not broken. There's no reason to fix it, it works. We should, as uh, Mr. Seltzer had pointed out, uh, undertake the program that requires the minimum disturbance to our current successful representation system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Foskett. Um, this is John Gersh. Good evening, Mr. Gershu. You need to unmute yourself. Thank you, sir. Uh, John Gersh, Kipling Road, a town meeting member, Precinct 18. I would uh, like to encourage the board to cause the least necessary disruption to town meeting. You've all seen the minimally disruptive plan from Don Seltzer. It does not dilute racial equity. And any greater disruption than that really gives the distinct impression of a gerrymander. And that just to me does not pass the smell test. Redistricting is required, but hacking democracy isn't. And I'm sorry, but that's what I think I've been hearing from Ms. Brazil. That's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gersh. Next is uh, Jennifer Seuss. Hello. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Good evening. Sorry it took me so long to figure that out. Um, Jennifer Seuss, 45 Teal Street. 
Um, just a couple of points. Um, I, I do know how emotional these uh, questions can be. I remember 10 years ago when 15 of the 21 precincts shifted, the sense of loss that my precinct boundaries were shifting and that people I thought of as part of my neighborhood were no longer part of it. Um, and, I, and I think that that's sort of a natural response. Um, I don't think that should be the dominant reason that you make your decision tonight. Um, I, when I talk to people around town, I, I, I do hear lots of people opposed, but I also hear lots of people in favor of the 16 precinct model. Um, I think people in favor of it may be less likely to come to a public meeting, so you may not be hearing from them in person, but I do think um, that there is a lot of support for that model. Um, I want to urge you to separate the questions of polling locations from this decision. Um, as you know, the Board of Selectmen Select Board can make uh, decisions about polling locations at any time, and that it may make sense to set, to make different decisions in the future, um, regardless of where what the precinct boundaries are. Um, you know, we have Gibbs, we have the high school command line, uh, we have possibilities of more drop boxes. Um, I, I, I do urge you to be really creative in the future when you make that decision, which I know you're not making tonight or this month. Um, I, uh, yeah, that's basically it. So I, 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 I like the 16 model. I think it does give us more flexibility. I think um, it, it has some nice features of it. Um, I guess just as a final thing, I'd love to urge through the chair, obviously at your discretion, um, if we could hear from people on the committee about the um, issues of uh, diversity inclusion and, and racial uh, minorities being you know, brought together in, in a way that, that, that promotes equity, um, I'd love to hear more about how that decision was made and sort of what people's viewpoints on the committee were, um, again, at your discretion. But just to make that formal request. Thanks. Okay, and thank, thank you, Ms. Seuss. And, and I will turn to, to Ms. Brazil on the, just on that point. Um, and I know there was written materials that, that you had um, published on, on the equity focus, but do you or um, any other members wish to address that right now I, or, or refer people to, to, to where that is addressed? Just, uh, Jill, do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, the equity work? Sure. Um, so thanks for letting me join tonight. <laughs> um, so as part of the process that we started um, when the working group came together, we basically thought outside of the box. Um, for us, change isn't a bad thing, especially for a community that speaks to wanting to endorse inclusivity and that you value equity and diversity, this is a massive opportunity to do so. Um, so what we did was we started by drawing our maps from scratch, um, not using the previous boundary lines, but looking at the data we had in front of us. So looking at race, looking at income levels, looking at age, looking at where the housing authority was, um, and not using Mass Ave as a dividing line. And so for us, that was how we started to build up what the 16 precincts looked like. And laying those over what we currently have, you can see in some of the maps, I don't know if folks have access to them all right now, but you can see the differences in precincts where you would be cutting out blocks of community members. Um, and what we were trying to do is make sure that no minority groups and minority groups can be in this context racial or by income, um, whether they're renters, homeowners, depending on what we're talking about, um, making sure that they were not, you know, kind of divided by different boundary lines and that they're all kind of able to vote as a single block. Um, so that was more, I guess, speaking to our original process of how we considered equity versus just going with what we've always done. Thank, thank you. Um, all right. Is oh, oh Slana, do you want to speak to, to that? I see your hand up. I don't know. If... Yeah. Sorry. Um, hello, Kelly Linema, Assistant Director of Planning and Department Department of Planning and Community Development. Um, 
So I think the one other thing to think about here is I know there have been um, some people who have said that having 16 precincts because those precincts would be larger in population would dilute minority voices. Um, that is a concern. One of the things that we were looking at in that is by drawing the boundary lines so that they encompass communities of color of our, our BIPOC folks, drawing the boundaries around those lines instead of cutting through them and having 15 town meeting members instead of 12 town meeting members represent that group. It becomes more likely um, with additional work and outreach, and this process is not done, um, with additional work and outreach that that community of people could elect somebody for town meeting who represents them. Um, so while the overall proportion of people of color or um, actually people of color, um, not necessarily eco economic in of economic interests or housing types um, is diluted, but while people of color may be diluted by the overall population, they are more able to elect somebody for town meeting who looks like them. And then I think the one other factor in that is because Arlington, particularly when you look at us compared to some of our peer communities, we do have a small um, community, we have small representation in our black community. We have a lower than average representation in our Latino community. But a lot of, in a lot of ways, those communities, the way, the types of housing that people in various communities of color live and the economic characteristics of some of those, some people in those communities, not all, um, but do more closely correlate with economic interests. So when we start to take economics and renting versus home ownership into account, when we draw the precincts so that we are maintaining those communities within a certain precinct, should our demographics change in the future, which I do believe the town anticipates that it will, those precincts will naturally incorporate um, a more diverse population. Great, thank you, Ms. Lanema. Um, all right, I don't believe there are any other hands. Mr. Chapdelaine, are there any other hands up? Oh, sorry. I just sorry. Yeah. I just have one more thing to sure. um, say or clarify. I did hear twice from previous comments that you know this reduction that we're suggesting is disenfranchisement. That needs to be cleared up. That's this process can no way be misconstrued or considered disenfranchisement because you are not losing the right to vote. You are not losing a privilege. You are simply having to rerun just like everyone else. So that term just really has a much bigger meaning and it's really not appropriate for this conversation. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. And, and I'm gonna to go to the board, we'll come around. I, I agree with you on the on the disenfranchisement. I'm gonna address that when I when I speak as well, but thank you for, for your comments there. Um, Mr. Chaplain. So there are now four additional raised hands for members of the public, two, two people for the second time. Okay, why don't we do this? There's two people, I, and, and I, I probably should announce it, we'll cut up, there's two, two people there for the first time. Why don't we take those two and then we'll go to the board. Okay. The first name so is- So I, I didn't open Judith up Garber. yet, if you could let us know who that is. Okay. Uh, yeah, Judith Garber. Hello. Good evening, Ms. Garber. Uh, hi, Judith Garber, um, 130 Mass Ave. I'm also a town meeting member in Precinct 4. Um, I'm slightly torn on this issue. Um, the pros, I really appreciate everything that um, the working group has done. I, I think it's great that they started from scratch. I think that the new precincts, both in the 21 version and the 16 version that don't separate by Mass Ave make a lot more sense. Especially, you know, I looked through the interactive map on the, the renters versus homeowners, and you can really see how on the 16 precinct map, especially how um, you don't have any renters left behind with by themselves in a mostly homeowner precinct uh, and vice versa as well. And I agree with um, Miss Brazil that as town meeting discusses a lot of zoning and density related issues that, you know, to make our voices heard. Um, is really important. Um, I, my one concern, you know, and this is 
Um, I, I know that a lot of community groups have been doing a ton of work in the past couple years on getting new folks to run for town meeting. Um, and I, I think that it is a little bit of a bur it's a bit, bit of a burden to run again. And I'm just really worried that all the new folks that we've gotten on town meeting this year, many from underrepresented groups, like people of color and renters are going to have a tough time running again the very next year or very close to year. I'm, I'm just worried we're going to lose that progress. That's my one concern there, but I, I do like the new precinct map. So I wanted to throw my, my voice in there as most of the um, arguments have been against. Thank you. Mr. DeCrosier. Oh, thank you, Ms. Gaber. I muted myself there, sorry. Um, yeah, who's next, Mr. Chaplain? Elizabeth Dre. Okay. Good evening, Ms. Dre. Good evening, Select Board. Good evening, um, members of the Representing Re Working Group. Thank you for your time. Um, I also want to really thank the members of the precincting working group. This is a very complicated and emotionally charged issue, uh, and I know it hasn't been easy. I also want to state up front that no matter what you decide tonight, I will have to rerun for my seat. I am in precinct eight. Um, I know that. And I also want to say that I support diversity, uh, increasing diversity and equity in, in Arlington. Um, and I also support that we make those decisions about those issues based on facts and that we use clear and accurate and precise language when we're talking about it. And when we start talking about this idea that because some town meeting members have to, are gonna be forced to run again, we should make them all run because that's more equitable. It's really more equal. And I, so I just wanna, I, I think it's really important that we understand that what we're, that's, a, that's an equalness argument and not an equity argument, right? So for equalness, because some town meeting members representing precincts that are out of compliance must run for re-election, then every town meeting member must run for re-election regardless of the circumstances. Equity would look really different. And it would say that because some town meeting members have to run and recognizing that all incumbent and aspiring town meeting candidates have different circumstances that the town will will create policies and procedures to ensure equity in their ability to campaign. And so I also have this concern that, um, so just to finish that, like this concern that we're using the word equity when we're really saying equal, and I wanna be really clear about that. I also um, am concerned that online, the information being put out um, only compares the information from the current map to the 16 precinct map and the new the new 21 precinct map and doesn't compare it to the least disruptive map that has been presented to the working group several times. So we really can't see apples to apples how um, diversity and equity is impacted in 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 all three maps. Um, and I know that Mr. Seltzer has done some data crunching, which shows that there really is um, not any negatives uh, to the least disruptive map regarding diversity and inequity. So I would love to see, have the ability as a resident to look at all three compared to each other online so that I can make a data-driven decision. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Is that everybody who has raised their hand once? Because I, I, I'm not really inclined to go back again for a second round because I, I want to hear from members. So if, if that's it, I think we will move on to con to um, comments from the members of the board. Yes, that, that is accurate, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Okay. Seltzer and Mr. Foskett have their hands raised. Okay. All right. I, I and I'm sorry, but I, I I think we you know we went through once there and and we have heard from them so. I'm going to turn to the board now um, for for comments, motions, um, and I'll start with Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would like to thank Ms. Brazil, Ms. Lineman, and Ms. Harvey for the, all their work on this on this um, on this effort. And I do want to address 
a few comments that were made in, in regards to public outreach and public comment. This certainly, in it's been a short time frame that we've had to address this issue, but I think both Ms. Brazil and the working group have done really an excellent job of reaching out to residents, providing information to residents as to the rationale for why they're looking to reduce number of precincts and responding to resident inquiries. Um, so I certainly want to thank them for those efforts and, and um, I think it's an unfair criticism to say that there was some sort of a farce public forum or whatnot that because I think we, we have made those efforts to reach out to residents. I, well, I understand the arguments in favor at this time, based on the review of the materials um, inquiries that I've had and input from many, many residents, both positive and negative, but certainly at least in my end, it seems to be more concerns about the, the negative impacts or the unintended in impacts that this could have on our voting and our representation in town meeting. I, for me, I think we've opened up a good discussion here. I think we'll continue this discussion and I, this could be something that in the future we decide is right for the town. But as of right now, from where I stand, as I weigh the benefits, the proposed benefits versus, versus the negatives that I see and the potential disruption, I would submit a motion to retain the 21 precincts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will second it for the purposes of discussion. Um, and um, I, I have um, a couple of questions. I'm not sure to whom to direct them. So maybe you can help me out with this, Mr. Chair. And um, uh, with respect to FinCom, Hey, what do you think would be the solution to that in the near term if we went to 16? Well, so let, let me just try to take that. The, the town bylaws says that you, for, for um, finance committee, it's based on the number of precincts. And if it's an even number of precincts, you add one member to create an odd number. Um, so you what, what would happen is the, the town bylaws would have to be amended, but that wouldn't be amended before next year. So, I mean, there's been discussion as to how, how you address that and, and uh, that that would have to be something that done, that, that takes place through a bylaw change. So, um, just to understand, so, so right now we have I mean, 21 members. And so if we were to make the change now, would we keep that 21 members going into um the next town meeting and then after the next no. town meeting I, no well i'll defer to attorney Hein, but my, yeah. my understanding is if the number of precincts are changed then the number of members of the finance committee would have to comport with the number of precincts um right from the point that you make that change mr chair you i i would i would i would think so yes all right okay. all right all right um Got to and uh, and so, okay and and there's nothing we could do in the interim to boost the participation in FinCom. We need to provide more, more, um, more, more assistance, more, more people to to work on issues. Not, not absent that change. Um. Okay. And, um. I guess. There's a matter of whether they're official members or not. I'm just kind of thinking out loud, just trying to come to a solution on that. All right, thanks. And um, so um, the other question is perhaps directed to um, Ms. Brazell uh, and, 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 and the other members of the working group. Um, was there any analysis done of, of the um, elections in 2012 and maybe the elections after that? I mean, I did a little bit of looking the, as um, Ms. Sue's um, pointed out, it was actually 15 precincts that changed and not three. And, uh, and so uh, I, I did a little bit of looking to see I mean, how many candidates ran, <laughs> I mean, uh, and, and what happened in the subsequent years. Did you all look into that to see if there were like any negative impacts of all 12 running? 
No, yeah. um, but I'm not sure I understand your question. What's tricky when you look back at local election turnout statistics is it's it's more driven by um, you know, who's on the ballot, um, you know, the contested races and, and stuff. So it's right. it's so variable. Um, I would I would have a hard time drawing a, a conclusion that there was yeah. a direct connection gotcha. to the re precincting. I hear you, and I'll, and then, and then I'll, I'll just say, you know, to you in, in response to um, your presentation about two hundred um, members essentially voting in in, in town meeting. Uh, that was the case up until twenty twenty, and in twenty twenty, it spiked up twenty percent, I mean, two hundred forty. And uh, and I want I wonder why I mean, it could have been virtual town meeting. <laughs> so 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 I just need to put in that little plug for for VTM. Uh, uh, so. Um, uh, look, I mean, I, I, um, I, as, as I've mentioned to several people, I mean, one of the things I often do when I have these kinds of hard-ish decisions uh, to make I mean, uh, is, is try to argue, I me mean, not so much the other side um, of it, but actually kind of argue it in reverse. And so I mean, uh, if, if we were to have 16 precincts, Speed, and then we're to try to argue to go to 21. I think it'd be a hard argument. I think people go, well, I mean, you got 16, you want to add five more? I mean, that's five more sets of ballots to deal with. I mean, it's going to be uh, more expensive, even though we could say it's not going to be a whole lot more expensive. And then if you were to say, well, you get 12 more town meeting members, I, I think people go, well, that's probably not worth worth the 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 the, the effort. You know, and 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 also, if you were to say, well, instead of having 15 people that can represent you uh, or from which you can choose, you know, uh, well, not from which you can choose, but 15 that will rep represent you, you're going to have 12. I think people feel, well, now I have me fewer people uh, uh, that me, I can actually vote on and, and, and have an impact me, in a body of 240 versus 252. But once again, we're dealing with some small changes in the denominator. So, so I find it. The fact that I can't get from 16 to 21 easily uh, makes me feel that me 16 perhaps has a, a lot more um, more um, value to it. Uh, me personally, I do like the idea of being able to have 15 people uh, representing me because it, it really comes down to to personalities. I mean, who you know. I mean, I mean, we're in that that space. Me where me where. It, of course, let me back up a little bit. I mean, we wouldn't want to have 200 precincts I mean, and then have like micro representation. Of course, we don't want to have one or two. I mean, but when you get into the realm of I mean, 10, 8, 10, 12, I mean, uh, 16, I mean, then it really does become a matter of how many people uh, you know. Because I mean, it, it really comes down to relationships. And I think I mean, that that the 15 gives me a greater chance of having a relationship with a town meeting member. But another reason I don't feel that that tied up in, in the number of people who are representing me is that it, when I was a town meeting member, I mean, I still am, it, but when I first was only a town meeting member, uh, I, and I would talk to people in at the gym who were in a different precinct, it'd be like, you know, I'm so happy to be a town meeting member. Whatever issue you have, let me know because even though you can't vote for me, I care about it. And I think we're very much that kind of town. So, so I'm not too concerned about the, the number of town meeting members uh, per precinct, but on balance, I mean, like I said, I do like the fact that, that um, I would have 15 uh, members that uh, I could potentially have a relationship with. Uh, uh, and also one thing I've noticed about the, uh, one of the other things that don't concern me about the size is that I kind of noticed in setting up the, the precinct meetings, me, a lot of times the precincts will combine because the, uh, there's just not enough the participation me, in the smaller precincts me, to warrant having 21 um, precinct meetings. So a lot of times we'll have two or three precincts combined together. So I think that kind of argues for the fact that me, we could stand to have me, more people in a precinct, who knows? Maybe we will then end up with sixteen precinct meetings. Uh, uh, and I, to support um, what Ms. Garbus said, I do like um, combining um, crossing over Mass Ave. It, uh, uh, I, I think that really gives a uh, a lot more power to the representation of the people who live 
uh, along Mass Ave who have a very different experience, I think, than most people um, in town. Most of them are renters, but also, I mean, Mass Ave is a, a major thoroughfare. So I think it's good to combine them and have their voices, have, get, have them, allow them to have stronger voices. And, and you know, um, usually in situations like this, these tough ones mean um, the, the letters WW. JD comes to mind, and I, I know for those of you who know me, you're probably wondering, you know, have re-precincting become my road to Damascus? Uh, but, but actually, it comes down to someone that I have come to trust a lot uh, and, and have, uh, he, he, this person has such integrity, he, and, and if someone were to propose something like this, we, I would go to that person to say, what should I do? So I would ask Julie, what would I, do? what should I do? What would Julie do in this situation? And, and, and we know, and so, and so because of that, it's gonna be easy for me to support this. And so uh, I will be voting against the motion and in favor of the 16 precincts. Okay, thank you, Mr. Diggins. And I just wanna clarify one point before I move on. I had mentioned the town bylaws, it's actually the town manager act Section 33 of the Town Manager Act that states that you have one member per precinct. If it's an even number of precincts, you then add one at large member. If it's an uneven number the way it is now, it's one member per precinct. And there has been some provisions to add at large members when there is difficulty finding people within a particular precinct. But that's that's what would have to be amended on the on the numbers. Is there is provisions in the bylaws about what the finance committee does, but the membership is in the town manager act. So just for clarification, um, I'll now turn to Mrs. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> it's quite the, in case people are confused, um, it's do we stay at 21 and uh, first I'll second Mr. Hurt's motion if it hasn't been seconded, do we stay at 21 or do we go down to 16? Um, just the finance committee fiasco or disastrous result um, that will come if we did support 16 precincts. Our job here tonight is just not to say where the lines are, not to say what 16, 21, uh, 100, I think someone said 100 precincts. It's just, do we stay at 21? and continue to have a good discussion? Or do we just all of a sudden flip to 16 where that decision isn't made by anybody here tonight except for the town clerk, the town moderator and the select board administrator. And, and the maps just recently came out. So, um, and in terms of, um, I know for Arlington, two of our three legislators didn't have any change in the district and Representative Gobley, I believe lost one in East Arlington. So, um, and so we're not really here tonight to, that's not what the board can do. We can't say, well, we're accepting 16 and we're accepting these recommendations from the working group because that's beyond what we can vote on. So um, I, I guess I'll go on the short end and say, I'm in favor of Mr. Hurd's motion. Let, uh, let's see what happens uh, down the road once we get out of the pandemic. And the other reason I'm just so fearful, if we did have 16 precincts, everybody here really needs to pay attention to long range planning. Yes, we got the APRA funding, um, which is probably, I'm hearing from people who I respect in the, Arlington's financial genre that that maybe buys us another year, but we're looking at a massive override. And on top of all the work we have to do through long range planning, through the uh, town manager, through the school superintendent to really see how we can get that. I mean, the number that we're talking is three to, to four times more than we've ever asked is should we go, should there be another um, operating override? So I, I think this is just not the right idea for this time. This is not the right time. So um, as I said, I'll be voting for Mr. Hurt's motion. Sorry I went on so long, got lost in my previous speaker's thoughts. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hellman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have some questions and then I'll share some thoughts. 
Uh, one of them is just to confirm um, what seems like an eternity to go when, when you, Mr. Chair, introduced this. Um, and you had some clarification about the timeline. Um, and I, I apologize for this. So do, do we need to find, deliver a final map by October 30th, or do we actually have more time? At this point, it says so. So this is my understanding, and, and this is just based on what happened a week ago when the governor signed the bill into law. Um, so I think the outside date for completing this process is December fifteenth. the The date contained in the act is that the city or town, in our case, town, completes its maps thirty days after after the legislature determines mm -hmm. its map. But no event shall that period be go beyond December fifteenth. So um, there is a little bit more time given what happened here. But it, but again, I think for tonight's purposes, we're yeah. talking about the number of precincts, and then future meetings we'll talk about future yeah. meeting or meetings uh, boundaries. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. But I think for me, the long view is helpful, just even in the context of this decision. Um, Another question, and this, uh, and this uh, I think goes to history, but also kind of to my larger thinking. Um, you know, 50 years ago is a long time. So it's difficult for us to understand uh, why uh, the precincts were increased to 21. But if I, if I recall correctly, and again, I, sorry to put you on the spot, Mr. Chair, and if you, and if, if, do, you do I recall that you had unearthed some suggestion that the town meeting had actually driven the process of, of going to 21 and not the select board? That's that, 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 well, the select board made the ultimate decision, but it was yeah. a special town meeting in the, in the fall of 1970 that started that process. Thank you. And, and that was that was under a different statute that was within Chapter 43A yeah. that, that, yeah. That, that caused that process. But that's that's where it, it began. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for indulging the irregularity of, of quizzing the chair. <laughs> um, this is a as long as there's no math questions, Mr. <laughs> <That's your right. laughs> um, the, I'm not sure where this one should land, Mr. Chair, so I'm going to leave you to discretion as to whether to ask the town council or a member of the working group uh, or the clerk. Um, but, you know, I think I hear a pretty clear expression of intent, um, or at least uh, of invitation to contemplate intent on our part, that if we define communities of interest by housing, renting versus zoning or by income level that, you know, that that may, uh, we could contemplate though that representation in town meeting, you know, having effects on policy decisions that town meeting might make um, regarding to housing and other things. So I'd wanna, I guess my question is, how sure are we that we would be on safe footing for that to be defensible as, as, um, um, as a purpose? Should that be questioned? Um, and and I you know I don't mean to suggest any doubt in the competence of the professionals that have pre presented this, but I think you know one of the members of the public um, raised the point. I think it just as a matter of due diligence, it would be good to to get a sense for where we'd likely to to be on that to make sure that that is you know all right to do. Yeah, I I don't know, Attorney Heim, if you have any comments on that or sure. So. I think it's important to understand a, a few things, uh, both for the board and just the general public, that what you're engaged in is a process of uh, trying to account for something that is not a, necessarily a super bright line test. So there's some very clear things that the select board and only the select board uh, has to make sure that uh, our maps comply with. And uh, we sort of talked about those very basic criteria, but the sort of additional aspect of it that um, can get a little bit more, uh, I don't wanna say subjective, but involves a more detailed analysis is, is it consistent with the constitution? Is it consistent with the Voting Rights Act of 1965? Does it dilute uh, a member of a protected class? Um, the general principle is that, you know, um, no equality among citizens exists as long as uh, one vote uh, basically produces uh, more, uh, more power in electing members than another vote. Um, and so we talk about these things in elections law with respect to uh, packing and fragmentation. But the reality is, is that it's a little bit unlikely that the LEDRC, uh, the Local Election District Review Commission would um, 
sort of extract one potential purpose from our discussion and afford it, you know, a disproportionate amount of weight. What they're really going to look at first is the maps and the data and see, do we have some sort of clear cut uh, pattern that suggests that uh, members of a protected class, their voting power is diluted under a map? Mm -hmm. um, and I want to note something that's important. The status quo um, can be found to have a dilution. It doesn't have to be that anybody intended to um, dilute or pack. The intention it can be totally irrelevant to either one of those things. And um, they're primarily going to look at the data first. So I don't think that the um, discussion that you're having tonight or the sort of comments about some of the things that feed into this are going to decide this one way or the other, whether you choose 16 or 21 precincts, I think that the LEDRCs is not going to be overly moved by one sort of facet of discussion. I hope that's responsive to your question, Mr. Helmer. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, I think that gives us some, some context to understand you know, how, how this works. Um, I have a, a follow-up to Mr. Dickens' questions about the effect on finance committee. You know, first I'll say that I'm sensitive to that, and I also think that we, you know, this is a 10-year decision, and so I'm trying to balance, you know, the long long-term versus the short-term um, effects. Um, so, but but you know, there is there is legitimate concern, short-term concern about you know the effect of that group. And I guess I'm trying to get an, a sense for how long we've been talking about. So, if I understand. Uh, Mr. Chair, the, I think the conclusion of the of your, yourself and, and town council is that as soon as we submit a map or as soon as it's approved um, and not the town election in the, in the spring, that's when the precincts legally change and therefore the, fin the FinCom membership would need to would need to change as well. Attorney Heim, if you want to comment on that rather than uh, giving my view on it. So I think the operative question would be, when do we actually change from 21 precincts to 16 precincts? Under the Town Manager Act, um, there is some discussion about um, how a term expires uh, on the 31st of the fiscal year, uh, following the fiscal year in which a member is appointed. But I have a tough time reading, um, and I'm not sure the Town Manager Act contemplates this situation. I have a tough time interpreting it however inconvenient this may be for everybody's discourse, that we would sort of be able to have residual members of the finance committees for precincts that no longer exist. If the precincts don't exist, they don't exist. And yeah. if somebody's not in a precinct anymore that they're supposed to be representing, usually if we say somebody's not in a precinct, mm -hmm. um, they're not supposed to be representing that precinct's interest. Um, yeah. So I don't know that I have a, 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 a better solution. I, I think that's unfortunate because uh, I know that it's an important matter for everybody's uh, discussion of this, but unfortunately, I don't think there's a convenient way out of that. Yeah, sometimes that's just life. Yeah, thanks. Um, I have a question. If, has, the, has the precinct working group determined um, in any kind of a way that you're, you could comfortably say tonight, if the board asked for what you clearly don't want, which would be a minimum change or at least change 21 precinct map. Um, do you know how many of those applying, um, you know, reasonable best practices, um, how many of those precincts would need to change and how many town meeting members would we be talking about that would have to run again um, if we try to minimize that, yeah, the number of precincts is board, board has changed. Um, I don't think we know specifically. I mean, if we were, um, I mean, we, we haven't drawn that map. I mean, I think Mr. Seltzer's map, um, you know, balances population. And if your goal is to just move the lines um, to balance population and um, disregard the rest of the charge, then yeah, um, the probably, I mean, I believe it's five, six precincts. I, th I think Ms. Lineman has a, something to add. Yeah, if I may also add, um, I guess it's also a matter of do you, how much attention do you want us to pay to the new legislative maps from the state? Um, mm -hmm. Because those would also factor in and those mm -hmm. would also lead to potential mm -hmm. change. Right, right. That's true. And that just happened yesterday or today. So, yeah. Yeah, good. No, fair, fair points. Fair points. Um, so here's my thinking. And 
I'm not going to be, I'm not trying to be cute here. I'm really not sure how I'm going to vote. Um, I want to hear from our last member, um, but here's, here's kind of where I'm at. Um, I suspect we have more precincts than we actually need. I think I'm, I find it persuasive that we are an outlier um, in that regard, proportionately to, to our neighbors, um, which isn't to say that we need to be exactly the same as our neighbors, but you know, from an administrative point of view, my gut for this has, all along has been that it's normal to resist change because we're, <laughs> we're, we're used to what we're used to. And we think, you know, and, and, and um, I'm not insensitive to the, uh, the effects and the inconvenience or even the expense or the risks of town meeting members having to, to rerun for their seats, especially a lot of them. I, I just don't think that should be our primary consideration. You know, and, and I think that's, um, that's a very fair point. I also think the, the arguments for efficiency are not trivial. Um, elections and voting is changing, is going to get more complex and for the better. Um, and that's good. And, you know, I think that it's, it's easy to say, well, just kind of the, the, the clerk's office needs to do the job and they will. <laughs> I have great confidence in that. But, you know, it, it's not a great thing to have room for more mistakes when, when you could have less room for, for mistakes because humans make them and when, when systems are complicated. Um, and I would say this, if we, if we decide to keep 21 precincts, I really hope this board and the finance committee in town meeting is fully committed to funding elections fully in a way that allows the clerk and, and her staff to, to carry them out. And that means getting, paying election workers is enough to, to attract them and, and all the other administrative overhead that's about to come. So I would just, you know, I'm not the type of person to fire a warning shot, but just as a caveat, you know, I think that we need to be thinking ahead. Um, I really don't think that the proposals that are set before us by the clerk and her team are attacking democracy. Uh, I don't believe that they change democratic representation or, or the, the franchise of voters. I think they just change the formula and how we do it. It is clearly within the bounds of state law. I think describing the process as a farce or as a disenfranchisement, frankly, is an insult to the integrity of the people who have done this work. It is fine to disagree with them. That is healthy. I don't see the benefit in argument ad hominem in that regard. And I'm not saying that everyone who's leveled the charge of disenfranchisement is, is ad hominem, um, but I think, I, I think Ms. Harvey's right, that term is a loaded term in our his, nation's history. And we need to be careful about how we bandy it about. Um, and I understand that, you know, having reducing the number of town meeting members does change, reduce a privilege for some town meeting members. I get that and I think we need to consider it. Um, but it's not hacking democracy. It's not attacking democracy. We can be better than that in our, in our civic discussions. But, this process had been necessarily compressed and that is not anybody's fault. Um, the reason I asked my first question is I, you know, the select board has the power to make a big change to, to, to re radically remake the map. And we, you know, no one's suggesting we automatically should just because, because we can, but, but I think we need to be careful. Um, and I appreciate a point that was made earlier um, that especially in the light of the history of how we changed precincts in the first first place, that there was some uh, some movement by town meeting first, and, and the circumstances were different. The law was different. It was a different age, different requirements. So we don't have to do the same thing we did before. But I think there's something to be said for caution about a five member elected body um, radically remaking the legislative districts without some kind of a broader mandate. And, and that worries me. And again, I'm not sure I'm gonna vote in a few minutes, um, but that's, that's, my, that's my concern, um, particularly because this timeline has been compressed and that is nobody's fault. That's the Census Bureau and the Census data and the pandemic that was just late. Um, but the finalized maps have come out very, very recently. Um, and I think that we've, there's been a good, in the best possible way, building the plane while flying it, which is you know what we say now when we're busy. But 
it's really true. And I think that the, the staff group working on this has done their absolute best to be transparent and to re roll out the data and the draft maps while they're working on the final ones. And that's, that's fine. But the result of that is that we've been compressed. We haven't had a lot of time. There hasn't been a lot of time to bring people along with, with some of the equity arguments. And, and that concerns me um, because I'm really interested in them. Um, but I'm conscious of the consequences of making a big decision when I'm not sure there are enough people who are there yet. Um, and that, that's, that's my hesitance. Um, and, you know, I guess I'll just leave it at that and I'll keep listening to further discussion and I'll figure out how I can invest consciousness in the vote. Okay, thank you, Mr. Helmut. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll um, make a few comments and, and then I think we may be ready for a vote. And I, I, I wanna thank the reprecincting working group all throughout this entire process. They've worked in good faith. They have sought input. You can even see in the summary of the feedback, it, it, it's evenly split on a number of the um, uh, responses and they just reported it the way they received it. Ms. Brazil and I had, had a number of discussions. We, I, I was really concerned with process hearing from the public. She was too. I wanted to give her the opportunity to present the proposal and, and, and have time for people to think about it and get back to us. And I think all throughout, this has been a very good discussion for what we consider doing. We have to do something because we're at that, that 10 year window. Um, back in July, I said it was very important to hear from town meeting members because town meeting members run precinct by precinct and, and I wanted to hear from them. And for me, um, for the town meeting members that reached out to me, for the town meeting members whose comments I saw, um, I just didn't see an overwhelming sense that a, a change from, from 21 to 16 is, is, is what, people, what people wanted. And, that, and that's not the only criteria, um, but I, I think we can still look at the map. I'm not, um, in, in, and see what changes can be made, for example, uh, for Mass Ave. Mass Ave used to be sacred that one side of it was the even side for, for precinct numbers, the other side was the odd side. I think there are very good arguments to overlap um, and, and cross Mass Ave for some precincts. But for a number of reasons where I am right now, given the timing, given the potential difficulties with the leg legislative maps, um, I'm gonna support Mr. Hurd's motion for 21 precincts. I do wanna say something about the finance committee. Uh, while I agree with Ms. Brazil, that should not be the primary criteria in deciding what you do 21 to 16. I will say that this year is probably gonna be one of the most challenging years that the finance committee faces because as Mrs. Mahan said, uh, we are looking at a deficit and there's some difficult decisions that are gonna to have to be made for the fiscal 23 budget. And I think it's it's critical for, for that committee to, to continue working in the short term as they are. And that wouldn't be possible if we went down to 16. And again, I look at my experience, I was on the finance committee. I know that with 21 members, you need that because if you change precincts, it's not like you choose which ones leave. You don't know you know, how that's going to shake out. And and um, I know there's been turnover on that committee. They're doing a very good job. It's a consideration. It's not the primary consideration. I said earlier this year that going from 252 to 240 was a concern for me. If, if there were other ways to, on the number of precincts, that the, the number actually could go up. But to Ms. Harvey's point, I do not consider that a disenfranchisement issue. And I think it's unfair to, to be critical of the proposal on that basis. What, what the 16 precinct proposal does is it's proportionate by precinct. Every precinct gets 15 votes and it's, in, and it's equal across the community. It's not, a, in my mind, it is not an issue of disenfranchisement. So I wanna thank the committee for the work they're doing. Um, I just, at this point, can't, um, go along with the reduction. So I'm gonna support the 21 vote, the 21 precincts. Um, I see Mr. Diggins has his hand up. Did you wanna say something further, Mr. Diggins? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had one quick question. It kind of revol involves being um, um, FinCom being and, and what would happen if we went to 16, although I realize that's not gonna happen. Uh, uh, um, so let's say we had, and this is directed to, to uh, Mr. Heim. So let's say we, we did 16 precincts 
end of the year. And we decided that we were going to have a special town meeting in February. What would, what would that happen? Because you're, you're pretty much saying that people can't represent precincts that no longer exist. I mean, so do town meeting members kind of disappear from their precincts when we change precinct numbers, if we were to change to 16? It's an excellent question, Mr. Diggins. Um, when you reduce the precinct numbers for town meeting members, you have a um, natural uh, election cycle. So you can kind of say, these are the town meeting members um, dur in these precincts for this term. If we reduce the number of precincts, I, I honestly would have to give it a little bit more thought as to how you would call a special town meeting between the time in which a precinct map was altered to reduce the number of precincts and the annual town election. I'm, I'm not prepared right now to tell you exactly how what would happen. That's right. um, you know, the, the, the FinCom issue is a little bit different because it's described in the Town Manager Act exactly how they're appointed and it doesn't contemplate this specific scenario. I would imagine that there's probably is some precedent in state law for what happens to a town meeting in these circumstances. So I could probably figure it out. I'm sorry, I don't have the answer off the top of my head. That's fine, that's fine, thanks. Okay, hey, thank, th thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, all right, any other comments from the board? Mr. Helmuth. Uh, just a question. Um, you know, I, I think if I'm counting the votes right, I think I, I think I know what the vote is is likely to be. So, if we end up with the 21 number now, at what point do we need to weigh in and give sort of further direction about what shape that takes? Because if I understand the options from the working group, um, you know, there's a proposal for all new 21 precinct that that does you know so, changes things around Mass Ave and does some more on on, on equity. So. What's our process going to be in, in, in timing, and, and do we doing that tonight, or is that a future meeting? Um, I just wanted to raise that as as a, as a task for us. Um, sure. Yeah. So, that's, so what I sure that, that's fine. You know. No, 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 no. That's a, that 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 that's appropriate. So tonight we were going to vote on the number of precincts. I was planning on having a subsequent meeting on the twenty fifth, but depending on the vote, I may have a discussion with Miss Brazil and members of the working group in terms of timing because there is a little bit more time now and, and and I think there are comments that board members may want to make in terms of once we select the number of precincts and and um you know maybe we can have that on on the 25th and, and still have a little bit more time because you're right there needs to be some direction as to to what you look at in terms of the um that the, the makeup of the precincts and as Ms. Linema said there has to be consideration of the legislative districts as well because we don't want to be in a situation where we're creating sub precincts if we if we if, if we can avoid that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And and I think I would just further suggest that um, and I'm glad that I'm glad that there's some more time because we also need to do all of those things and also make sure that we uh, give the public a chance to to have enough time to really react to a single final draft map. Um, how, whatever that looks like to make sure so that they can weigh in and point out anything that we missed and 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 make their case. So um, so that's that's all good news. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. So unless there's other comment from the board, we do have a motion by Mr. Hurd to maintain 21 precincts. That was seconded by Mr. Diggins. I don't see any hands, so I will turn to Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. No. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's a four to one vote. Okay. Thank you, Attorney Heim. Thank you, Ms. Brazil. Thank you, Ms. Lineman, and thank you, Ms. Harvey. Thank you for your time. Yeah. And, and, th and thank you to the members of the public too. We, we received a lot of input from people um, just as we wanted. And, and it was uh, helpful as we went through that process and uh, we'll continue to do that as we move forward. Um, all right, so we are now on to item 11, ARPA funding presentation um, by uh, Mr. Chapdelaine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just get my screen ready to share here. OK. 
Okay. All right, can, can you all see the PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I will try to be very brief and update um, on the ARPA framework. I have made a series of changes based on the feedback provided by the board, as well as comments from the public over the course of the past several months. Um, I know we're short on time trying to wrap as close to 11 tonight. So I'll run through this fairly quickly um, and then obviously very happy to engage uh, with the board and members of the public on this topic. So a uh, quick refresher, um, we've been talking about this um, publicly since the start of August. We're here tonight to provide an update on this framework and solicit further select board review and comment um, with a, a hope that we can come back uh, just about or a little less than two weeks from now on October 25th um, to pursue select board endorsement on the framework. So if I if I can, I'll dive, dive right in. I just wanna move my little, uh, screen so I can see everything here. Um, I'm just gonna quickly go line by line. Since the last time the board saw this, I have slightly reduced the amounts uh, that are currently recommended to be allocated in the first category of revenue loss and general fund. And I did that really for twofold reasons. One, to try to get closer to what our projections are. We're constantly updating our projections on what might be able to be attributed to a revenue loss that could benefit the general fund as well as you know, using it to match up with what might be realistic while also trying to meet some of the requests and demands of funding, um, funding other areas of this framework. So I've reduced um, year one had been at a million, brought that down to 500,000, years two and three had been 2 million and brought that down uh, to 1.5 million as you see there. Public health remains the same as it had been in this, the prior iteration of this plan. Premium pay, um, which I fully heard and understood to be uh, a matter of priority for multiple members of the board at the last meeting. Um, I increased from what had been 1.5 million to 3.247893. I know that's a very specific number, and that is because I increased it using uh, both monies from the revenue loss general fund category, as well as the entire reserve. So the premium pay number really became the balancing number to balance out with the total ARPA allocation. Um, again, I wanna reiterate, I heard board members loud and clear about the desire to fairly treat our frontline workers and those who reported in the course of the pandemic uh, and the need to maximize the amount of benefit that we can provide to them. Um, I was asked to have staff run an analysis of how, an, or an estimate of how many workers would be eligible. Our estimate is that a total of approximately 300 town workers would be eligible to receive premium pay per the statute or per the interim final rule. Uh, not every uh, one of those 300 employees would be eligible for the entire uh, benefit. We would want to approach it from a prorated basis based on how many either days or likely months you reported in person over the duration of the pandemic. Um, so though it's 300, um, just being frank, there are employees who did a lot of in-person work, but not as much as police and fire. So we would wanna handle that accordingly um, as we went into negotiations. Our analysis also suggests that teachers should be considered, uh, given consideration and considered eligible under this category. Uh, again, not working in person as much as other 10 employees, we would wanna approach that from a prorated basis as well. My goal with this figure is to uh, work with every bargaining unit. We have intensively begun bargaining with one unit, the AFSCME bargaining unit, and are in contact with the other bargaining units though we have not met to be yet uh, with a goal of having both collective bargaining agreements ready for town meeting uh, for ratification in the spring as well as having as part of those agreements an ability to pay, to pay, excuse me, premium pay before town meeting in the spring. So again, I wanna reiterate this being uh, me hearing the board loud and clear as this being a top priority and something uh, we will actively be working on um, in trying to come to terms with all of our bargaining units to make happen as soon as possible. 
Moving down from there, uh, I've added an equity and outreach line, uh, this being specifically responsive uh, to feedback I've heard from the community. Um, under this line, uh, I would be proposing that we would seek out the provision of translation services for many of our, our documents and programmatic related documents in town, as well as enhancing community outreach efforts in the rollout of this plan and other town services. Um, a deeper proposal around these efforts um, will be developed, but I wanted to put this in here for the board's consideration and comment. I've changed the name of the next category. It had been listed as mental health, but I changed it to behavioral health to tie directly to the language that's contained within the interim final rule. Though at this point, I haven't changed any numbers in, um, in this category. I do plan on having a deeper, a deeper conversation with Christine Bongiorno about whether or not any more resources should be considered here. Um, and if that is the case, I'll bring that forward the next time I come to the board. Below that, low-income broadband support has not been changed uh, since the last time we spoke. Um, there is still question about whether or not communities that are already served with any form of broadband will be eligible. We're still continuing to work through that and learn more, but for the time being, keeping this category here. Small business assistance and tenant assistance uh, have been kept the same as the last time we came together. No changes have been proposed um, there in terms of that funding. Uh, the next category, I've changed the name again. Instead of addressing food insecurity, I've changed the title to providing food security to match up with current, um, current language or use of language around addressing issues of food security with residents. Uh, as you can see, the numbers have not changed in this particular category. However, I do plan over the course of the next week and a half to work more closely with Foodlink as well as Arlington Eats uh, to make sure that we're um, planning an allocation that is both fair and meeting the needs of these organizations as they work to meet the food needs of Arlington residents. So moving on to the next half of the framework. In HVAC improvements, that number has not changed. Uh, I don't yet have a more refined scope of exactly what that work would look like, but that's something that we're working towards. Investment in parks and open spaces. Again, that number has not changed. And I do hope actually by the next meeting to have something more refined from, uh, from parks and recreation uh, to be able to propose to the board for some potential initial investments out of this category. Water sewer spending. Um, has been slightly reduced from the last time I was before you in order to um, both provide more money to premium pay as well as increase some of the funding that's being proposed in affordable housing. Moving down to affordable housing, um, in these categories, there has been um, really two changes here, increasing in years two and three, the amount in the affordable housing unit production from 1.25 million to 1.75 million. Uh, thereby increasing the total allocation proposed in affordable housing by $1 million. Um, and at this point, making it currently overall the largest standalone category within this ARPA framework. Below that, uh, you see the homelessness category that has not been changed since the last time I presented to the board. And administration and oversight has been kept the same that has also not changed since the last time that was presented to the board. I mentioned earlier that I eliminated the reserve line that had been in the prior iteration of the plan, again, primarily using that to increase the amount of premium pay that's being allocated or recommended to be allocated within this plan. Moving on from there, at the last meeting, um, it was also requested by the board to provide a, a categorization of the proposed framework and its expenditures by the sections within the statute. So I've broken this down into, as you can see, supporting public health expenditures, addressing negative economic impacts caused by the public health emergency and aid to the communities and populations hardest hit by the crisis, providing premium pay for essential workers, and investing in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. So you can see the totals across the bottom, as well as the percentage of totals uh, within each category. Um, and speaking with a board member today, I did mention this was a very helpful exercise for us to really cross-reference what we were including in the plan by the statutory reference and helping us really ground our basis for proposing these expenditures 
in the statute and in the interim final rule. I will note in those categories, the administration and oversight is not included as though that is allowed by expenditure. It's not one of these, it's not contained within one of these main categories. So if you were doing an active total on the bottom, um, you would be off by that amount of administration and oversight. Next, um, wanted to provide just another look uh, at how the spending or the recommended spending is breaking down. Uh, you can see significant investments in affordable housing, water and sewer spending, investment in parks and open spaces and premium pay. Uh, and then uh, as you can see, the numbers start to go down from there, at least in terms of percentage. But I think it also demonstrates the, the width and breadth of what we're trying to take on and the investments that we're trying to make in the community. So again, um, we're here tonight uh, to solicit further board review and comment, hoping to come back uh, 12 days from now to pursue select board endorsement. And I think the only further thing I'd say um, before engaging with the board is that, I think as the board has seen, there are aspects of this framework that are needed through the backup memorandum provided by town staff. And there are some pieces of it that still need a lot of work to build out what the actual expenditures in the category would be. And when we come back on the 25th, I think in areas specifically like um, the public health assistance or the public health um, expenditures as proposed by Christine Bongiorno or the small business assistance and tenant assistance programs as proposed by Jenny Rate, I would like endorsement to move forward with those as soon as possible on the 25th. Whereas comparatively, things like the affordable housing or even water and sewer to some degree and parks and recreation. I'd like endorsement to move forward with allocations in the amount or near the amount as what's being proposed with an understanding that the detailed investments are yet to come and will be brought back before the board when they're prepared for consideration. So with that, um, I will stop the share of the screen for now and happy to discuss any of this with the board. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chapelain. Um, and I will start this evening on this one with Mr. Diggins. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, uh, so is it appropriate to move acceptance of this report from the sure. town manager? Okay. You know, uh, I don't want to do unnecessary motions. So, so if it's not necessary, it's fine. You know, so um, uh, 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 Mr. Manager, I mean, uh, I like very much uh, what I see. And, and uh, there is a former uh, select board member uh, who often says, I mean, um, our budget reflects our values. I mean, and every time I, mean, I hear that, I, mean, I, I feel that that's really true. Uh, and and, and, and uh, I think uh, uh, the changes that you've made I mean, um, certainly reflect I mean, our values. I mean, and, and also um, reflects I me mean, the the um, spirit of cooperation. And I don't know if compromise is the right word in the solution. It's more getting closer to what we really wanna do as a community. So what I like is that I me mean, from the revenues, I me mean, came, I me mean, some funds I need mean, to increase I mean, premium pay and to increase housing. Because I think as a community, I mean, we should do that. I mean, um, and so the community as a whole is supporting I me mean, providing more pay, more premium pay. And, and supporting more housing. So uh, I, 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 am, I am very supportive of that. And I guess I have a question uh, and, and that is it, um, we can only give premium pay to, to um, employees of the town? The statute would actually allow for premium pay for private sector employees as well. Okay, all right. So, so for instance, I mean, if we have grocery um, store workers at our local grocery stores, have we? Is that something that we're contemplating in this? I have not to date contemplated that for recommendation. I've considered it in discussion. Um, I think this, the statute certainly allows for it. Um, however, I think I, I do have very. I think I want to measure my words right. Uh, serious concerns about the administrative undertaking that yeah. would require in yeah, managing right. a program like that. Right. And managing it in an equitable manner. Right. Um, so, so I, that's, those are my thoughts today. It's not currently contemplated in the plan that was presented tonight, though it is allowed under the statute. Yeah, no, I understand that. And, um, and so I mean, let me put some brain power into that and maybe see what 
other places are doing I mean, for that, because those are the folks I mean that could use I me mean, the help the most. I mean, in fact, as I read through the interim report, I mean, it's really about I mean helping the people who are very low, who very get very low income. I mean, and and as you know, the limit I mean, is one hundred fifty percent mean of what I mean they would make. I mean, and so I would like to see us max out I mean on the very low income um, people uh, the most. I mean, and so. So yeah, I understand the administrative challenge I mean, and 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 um, I mean, I'll see what I can do without adding to your workload by I mean, by talking to you more. I mean, so uh, uh, so uh, so that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helen. Thank you, and very well said, Mr. Diggins, about quoting the the former member and uh, about budget and values. Those words ring in my in my ears. Uh, as well, and I really liked seeing the pie chart because that's a really a really good way to focus our attention on that construct. Um, so th thanks to you, Mr. Diggins, and thanks to Mr. Chaplin for for making it. Um, and thank you also, Adam, for for being so responsive to the board and to the community. I, I'm liking what I'm seeing with this. I appreciate the added investments in um, in housing and in, and in premium pay um, and um, I think it, it all it all is good, and I and I completely understand that you know you, by by necessity we need to kind of come to an agreement on the categories, but understand that the specifics necessarily need to work be worked out over time, both under the statute and uh, under, under what we can you know manage administratively. Um, the one request I would make would be if if um, because food security is so important that if you could just take another pass to make sure that we are meeting the needs of our organizations in Arlington that are providing uh, food security. And, I, and um, you know, I value the work of Foodlink and Arlington Eats um, a lot. They are wonderful organizations, but um, I know that Eats had a, particularly had a very modest uh, request and, you know, I appreciate that, but, you know, this is an opportunity and, and the need is great and the need is, is, is probably going to keep growing. So if you could just take another look and make sure that we're taking care of those folks um, and their ability to serve the community for the long run um, and both for both organizations, that'd be great. Happy to do that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that, that's all thank I have you. to share. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mrs. Mahan. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, if I could, I, I don't think there's been a second yet or has there? <laughs> I've, I forgot there has not. It, so yes. Know, okay. <laughs> Sorry, that's okay. I, I, the next person can do it too. I would just ask my colleague, Mr. Diggins, if he'd take a friendly amendment and have his motion be moved for seat versus acceptance, because some things are probably getting, usually the, the votes are move receipt, move no action, move approval. And receipt means we're receiving the report, except for me, I couldn't really vote for it because there's a few categories I don't accept. Ms. Mahan, not only do I accept it as a friendly amendment, I accept it as an education, education thank part you. of the educational process. Thank you. Okay. Um, th th thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, just try to make a few comments. I want to thank the manager um, for uh, continuing to work, work on this and um, indicate um, there's a work in action. Uh, when I first saw that there was vote requested by the manager on October 25th, I was like, no way, because um, I'm still, but, but the manager has clarified it's just certain um, categories. And because my brain is scrambled egg rice right now, if I could ask the manager and or through the chair, just to shoot an email out tomorrow. Um, I know we get the information about, next week about the 25th meeting, but if you could just send out what you said at the beginning about what you would be asking for on the 25th, but you're not asking for all of the, the categories, I would appreciate that. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about uh, premium pay for essential workers. Those are workers who had to come to work. This money is for frontline essential workers not anybody who worked at home. So I'm gonna be very upset if I hear consultants uh, get this pay. Um, and it's for the years 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, 
2023 um, and perhaps even into 2024, depending on how you do the fiscal year. So um, when the pandemic first hit and when, when the president talks about the American Relief Act, his top three things he speaks about, premium pay for essential workers is either the first or second thing he consistently talks about. Number three changes dependent on the audience. Now, I still think, and the other thing is when I saw October 25th, the reason why I was upset was I know you still haven't reached out to police and fire. Um, I, and you, you representing to the board, I've reached out to them. Your, your administrative assistant hasn't contacted them. You haven't contacted, emailed, text, walkie talkie, anything. I don't know what contact you're talking about with all due respect. If it's, you saw them and waved, that doesn't count. I really want you to make more of an effort to, to set up those meetings only because you've, we've had this conversation, you and I, since July. Um, and I just don't see it happening. And I, you know, um, so leave it at that. Now, in terms of the figure that you have uh, put aside, I spoke to three town leaders who have knowledge um, with employees, town finances. And I said, if we truly did the essential workers, police, fire, public works, and if I'm missing anything else in there, you know, not M schedule, not consultants, not anybody who worked at home, you're not an essential worker. I don't know how you read that. If you go by, I know the manager references, you know, and this is the statutory, statutory reference. Yeah, there's a reference in the US Treasury Department of how you can allocate funds uh, for premium pay for essential workers. And the uh, allocation in there, when I said to my colleagues last week, and I thank Mr. Hurd for, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that at least one or two, three more of my colleagues will agree with me on it. I said, if I think they deserve the max. And I'm going to say that um, because the town manager makes this decision. I'm one of five who can express her opinion. Um, from the three people I spoke to off the record, I said, I'm not going to quote you. They said it would be about 5 million if we wanted to. All these police, fire, public works people, you know, we couldn't put the banner up, put the pieces of wood, can't fig figure out half the decals. It's kind of insulting. Um, I, I was told that we did premium pay, which is allowed by the law. Basically what the federal government is saying, if you want to pay your essential workers the max, because you feel like they did the max, maybe even more. You want to give them an A, you give them the max. I was told five million. The manager said seven million. So I'll take the manager seven million. I don't think it's even close. I think I stand by the five million. So if you go by, we can give them five million. If you want to give them an A, the max allowed by law, um, and that's seven million. If we want to give them an F, because they didn't really do that good, we give them twenty five percent, one point. 9 million. If we want to give them, well, you know what? You're okay. You're like a C minus. You're average. We can give them 50% of what we could give them if we felt we wanted to give them the max premium pay because they earned it. That would be 3.5 million. So right now we're giving the town employees our essential workers who we all care about so much and thank gosh for them and we can't thank them enough. Yes, this is how you thank them enough. So we're not even, we're probably giving them like a C minus. We're not even at 50%. 50% is 3.625, sorry. Now, if we want to give them, you know, a B minus B, you know, you did, you did good, you're okay. We can give them 75% of what the manager says is 7 million. I'm, I firmly believe it's 5 million, closer to five, but I'm trying to use his number against him. So if we want to say, you know what? You're a little more than average, you're pretty good. We're going to give you 75% of the money that we could give you. That's 5.125. Or if we wanted to do the max, we could give them seven. So I say that just to say that to my colleagues, we have time to digest it because we're not voting on this aspect on the 25th. I'm going to tell you, and I would ask the manager to get back an approximate number. It's not what he said was five to seven million, kind of scale you here in a bigger number, in my opinion. It's closer to five. And then you look at that number and really state your conscience. And my thing is, I'm going to advocate for whatever group. I was in with Karen Malloy advocating for non-union employees management who are working from home, who other people had an issue with. And I defended them to, to the get-go because you can work from home. I've been doing it. 
But um, I don't know why when we keep saying, oh, we want to do what we can and we could never thank you enough. Here's a way you can thank them enough. I think it, give them the max, not a statutory reference allows you to give them less. Um, I think it's closer to five. Um, and again, I would beg the town manager, I don't want to keep having this conversation. And I have this conversation offline too. I have it on the phone. Have you met with them yet? Oh, I'm reaching out. They've been contacted. No, they haven't. A contact is you or your administrative assistant. I apologize to Mrs. DeFrancisco if that's not her title. She sends out a Google thing or you make a phone. I don't know how you contact the unions because I don't get involved. I really don't. So I don't know if it's a phone call, but there's no reason why you've been saying you're going to do it since July. And here we are in October. So, um, and I did send to um, I, uh, email conversation with uh, the manager and the chair when I saw that the APRA funding deadline had been extended to January. So we still have more time to talk about these um, important issues. And on everything else under the American Relief Act, I'm gonna let my colleagues speak to that, but I, I just can't let this go by for the town employees that um, to me, they should be, as the president did, the top three considerations. So, but to me, it's still an insult that we're not even at the manager's number of full 7 million. We're not even at 50% of what we could give them. I think they're worth a lot more than 50%. I think they're worth a hundred, but so um, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Always a tough act to follow. I do, so I do appreciate the presentation. Um, I do definitely appreciate the increase that we've seen from the 1.5 to the 3.2. I think it's a little closer to where we should be. Um, where I come with premium pay is that it's a one-shot deal because we can only dole it out on the first year. We have a number of categories that we can continue to reallocate in year two and three and on. Whereas premium pay, we make one decision and that's it. So I would like to see, I'd also like to see some more, I, I mean, I'm not gonna go in say i think we need to have a specific number um the number that i always had in my head was four million which i think we're closer to that i mean i don't think and it's something that we can talk about in the next couple of weeks before we make the decision i know that's below what mrs mahan is proposing and it's certainly not because i think our police and fire are doing a b minus and i don't i don't say that to throw that back on you, Mrs. Mahan, it's just that's the number that I had thought that would be in to, in my understanding is that what we're looking at when we put a number there is it's like a credit card, that's your credit limit, then that's what we've allocated to premium pay, then we have to go in and do the breakdown and negotiate with the unions and see who who qualifies and who gets and what percentage they get based on the percentage of time that they spent in the office versus remote. Um, but again, we can continue to talk about that number, but in my head, when we initially had looked at that at 1.5 and looking at the other breakdowns, I, I had come up with 4 million and I think that's a good place to start the negotiations. Um, and then again, we can take, the problem when you have a chart like this is you're shifting funds from one place to another, but if we take it from a year two, category there's going to be some categories that in year one that were unexpended that carry over and so i anticipate in year two there'll be some shifting regardless of what we do with prim premium pay and then we'll have our final guidance on what, whether or not we can even use opera funds for revenue offsets um but i so I, my comments are i think we're moving in the right direction on premium pay but i think we should allocate some more to that particular category, again, just because it's a one-shot deal, and we uh, we want to make sure that we have enough allocated there in year one. Whereas if we go and peel back the onion and see that there's going to be a higher expenditure than we had anticipated, more people are included, and 
And I just want to make sure that we have the ability to address that and fully compensate our essential workers, particularly police, fire, and DPW for the work that they did in person during the pandemic at great risk to themselves, which we've covered in the last meeting and we don't need to go, go over again. But that's the one item that I think that we can do a little work on. And not, to, not that I want to take away funds from any of these incredibly important causes because we want to be able to support all of the values that we have in in the city in our town and we're doing so with the breakdown i think we can do some work on that one item thank you thank, thank you mr chair thank, thank you mr hurd and and um and I, I, I while i'm happy to see that the amount has been increased on premium pay i like the approach mr hurd just referenced in terms of um, having an amount, having a discussion, and, and as we said, um, with some exceptions that, that particular earmarks, th these amounts are going to change over time. And to me, the most important thing to take place is the conversations between the town manager and, and the various unions. And I know um, I'm not going to get into a definition of what contact was or, or, or what happened. I know there's been some sort of um, Outreach, I'll call it outreach, and I, I don't know the specifics of it, but I think it's really important to have those discussions because the discussions need to take place between the manager who, who conducts our bargaining with the unions and, and the union representatives. And people have asked me about it, and I said, that's the discussion that needs to take place with the manager. I think it's appropriate um, to, to have the range that Mr. Hurd spoke about. I um, also want to say to one point Mrs. Mahan made without question, the definition of essential worker does not include someone who performed telework. Um, it, it is performed from a residence. It's there's a very specific definition of what the essential worker is, and I, I, I think we we have our arms around we have our arms around that, and it clearly does not include somebody who's working part time from from home or or has has worked from home. That's not what this provision is all about. There are the things that we mentioned at the last meeting in terms of some definitional references that I still think need to be nailed down. And, and Mr. Chapdelain mentioned earlier, there are other categories of workers, even if we're just within the town, namely teachers are a category that, that would qualify for premium pay, albeit not to the same degree as, as police and fire, for example, who are out there every day, but it, 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 there, there is a, um, they qualify. And, and so it, it, it's, I, I think that's something that you know, maybe it needs to be looked at. You raised it earlier, Mr. Chapdelain. But I think the most important thing I can say to you is let's have the, I'd love to see you have those discussions and, and, and you know, see, see what comes out of it. And, and um, because that's what we've been telling people that, that, that those discussions need to take place. As far as the other categories are concerned, um, I think, there are some things that when we come back on the 25th, one thing that, that comes to mind is small business assistance. We had a meeting with the um, the chamber and, it, and one of the things that was mentioned is for these small businesses that really need the help now, if we can release some funds, that may allow them to continue on. And, and so I think we look to release that earlier rather than later. There's other categories that I think we need flexibility in um, such as the affordable housing category, um, water and sewer, and, and the investment in parks and, and, and open space. There are things, there are needs, there are perhaps opportunities that are going to arise in the future, maybe even in the near future, that, that we can use those funds and we need to, to, to maybe try to be flexible on that. But overall, I appreciate you parsing this out. Um, and, and having the different categories, I think you've heard us further on, on premium pay in, in particular. The other thing I would say to the board and, and to the public is the four categories that the manager had that he laid out um, for various spending, the state has $5.3 billion worth of opera funds. They have the same four categories. So I think there needs to be some coordination too as we go forward what needs perhaps as the state taking care of that maybe we reallocate or, or, or take a look at, um, and we're not gonna have all the answers on that, but it's, it's the same categories, the state and 
local governments in terms of what they can spend things on. So um, I think it's appropriate to, to, to receive the report now you've gotten feedback. Um, and I think to the extent that you can identify specific things at the next meeting that you'd like us to, to approve for specific spending priorities in the short term, I think that would be helpful just to, to start releasing those funds. And then also um, to repeat it again, just to, to have that important dialogue that we refer to. Um, is there anything that you'd like to say, Mr. Chapdelaine, in, in response to our comments? Yes, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I think the primary thing I would say is I would like, and I think I can draft a narrative vote for the board's consideration that would make clear what I'm asking for endorsement to move forward with and implement versus what I'm asking for endorsement to do further work on uh, to come back and propose for implementation. So I can I think I can keep the spreadsheet as it is with, with changes and iterations to come and then draft a narrative, um, a, a narrative vote for the board's consideration. And, and again, I continue to hear um, you know, the majority of the board asking for a further look at premium pay and, and without directly responding um, to board members' comments, I would say I, 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 am, I am committed to it. Still the only municipality that's receiving ARPA funds to be even looking at it. And I feel I feel good, and I feel I feel that I'm I'm handling this in good faith, with due respect um, to our hardworking union members. And, and thank you, Mr. Chapdelaine. Um, I had said previously that we were going to have comment on this. It's 11:05 now. I I I think what I would propose. There are a few hands up. I what I'm going to propose that we do. We're not going to take a full vote tonight on this, other than to receive it. Um, I will put this on early in the agenda on the 25th, um, and we will allow public comment at that time. I, I just think we're, we're past the time that we're going to run our meeting. And I would say to those people who wish to be heard, um, if you want to reach out to us directly in between meetings, please do that. I, I know one of the hands up I had an exchange with today. So I'm happy to have that type of conversation. But I think given the hour, um, I don't think it's fair to the board members at this point, especially where we're not voting to endorse anything in particular. So I want to apologize. I did say we'd have public comment, but I think given the hour, we do that at the beginning of the next meeting. And, and unless there's any objections by board members, that's the way I'd like to go tonight. Okay. All right. So, um, so with that, we have a motion to receive Mr. Chapdelaine's report, that was by Mr. Diggins, with a second by Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Attorney Hahn. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmer. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Unanimous vote. Great. Thank you. Um, and the last item tonight is is new business. Attorney Hahn. No new business. Uh, Mr. Chapdelaine. Given the hour, no new business. Okay. Mr. Helmer? Given the hour, no new business. Mr. Diggins? Negative. Mr. Hurd? I wouldn't remember if I had it. Mrs. Mahan? For my own sake, I can wait. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I just have five things, so no, <laughs> just kidding. Um, I don't have anything either, so I will uh, take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, great. Okay, a motion by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, and have a good night, everyone. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Sam's vote. Cheers, okay, folks. Thank you, everyone. Good meeting. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Thank you.